I'd like to welcome you to the Seoul Copyright Forum 2023. I'd like to sincerely welcome all of you. My name is Yanhua Li. I'll be your MC for today. Thank you. It's a really big honor for me to be able to be with you at this very meaningful event. And I'd like to thank all of you for being here despite your busy schedules. Uh, in order to um, allow a bigger audience to enjoy today's forum, today's forum will be screened on a real time live through the copyright TV of the KCC. And so I'd like to thank all of you joining us through online on YouTube. So today we'll be talking about generative AI and copyright. And as you know very well, with the emergence of the chat GPT recently, the issue of copyright in regard to generative AI has become a really big topic all around the world. And so today at this forum, we'll be discussing AI and copyright issues, and also we'll be having a discussion about ways forward to um, navigate through the debate. So we look forward to your participation to the very end, and please contribute your uh, insight. So let me run through today's program. First, we're going to have an opening speech and then a keynote followed by a topic number one about the current status of generative AI's creative technology and the relevant copyright issues. And then in the afternoon for topic number two, we'll be talking about generative AI, legal challenges and recommendation. And we've invited various uh, prominent guests to talk about policy uh, challenges in Korea and elsewhere around the world. And and, and that last part of uh, topic number two, we'll be giving an introduction for the very first time of the uh, the guideline, the user guideline on AI and copyright, which the Korean government has been preparing through a working group that was formed in February. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask the speakers, please use the uh, question submission sheets and uh, please submit it to the reception desk. And then we'll collect the questions and during the uh, discussion session, we'll be able, able to entertain those questions. So we look forward to your active participation. So thank you uh, very much. We're now going to go on to the opening speech. We'd like to invite Mr. Pyonggu Choi, the chairman of the Korea Copyright Commission, the host of today's forum. Let's welcome uh, Mr. Choi onto the stage with a big round of applause. Distinguished guests and participants who are with us virtually on live streaming, good morning. I am Choi Byung-gu, Chairman of the Korea Copyright Commission. I am extremely delighted that you are finally gathered here to hold the Seoul Copyright Forum 2023 in person for the first time in four years after 2019. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the persons who work hard to successfully prepare this year's 16th Seoul Copyright Forum. In particular, I would like to express my deep gratitude to Professor Mira Sundara Rajan of University of California, Davis School of Law, who traveled a long distance to deliver keynote speech today. As well as Maxwell Shields, legal, legal counsel of Mid Journey, and Andrew Foglia, deputy director of the U.S. Copyright Office, Elena Trafobia, professor of the law at the University College London, and Gavin Fu, head of the copyright unit at the Intellectual Property Office of Singapore. Thank you very much. Also, I would like to ex extend my deep thanks to all the speakers from home. Uh, Mr. Go Hangyu, senior researcher at LG Electronics AI Laboratory, and Mr. Hwang Son Chol, director at Korea Music Copyright, Copyright Association, and Professor Ge Sung Yoon of Busan University, and Professor Yoon Hae Son of Hanyang University, and Kim Hye Chang, director general at the Copyright Korea Copyright Commission, and Professor Yi Dae-hee, 
from Korea University who will be moderating the discussion today. The Korean Copyright Act Article 2, Paragraph 1 defines the uh, copyrighted work as a, a creation that expresses human thoughts or emotions. This definition is echoed in other countries as well. The US Copyright Office has rejected to register an image output of a generative AI program on the ground that it does not meet the requirement of the human associate. As the definition of copyrighted work suggests, we have taken for granted that creativity is a value unique to human beings. However, the emergence of generative AI, such as ChatGPT, is challenging our long-held belief. With the increasing incorporation of ChatGPT and other generative AI in creative activities and the wider use of AI output, you are faced with challenges that go beyond the existing copyright law regime. Authorization and compensation of authors for use of their work as a AI training data and compensation for and protection of AI output such as text, image and music and the most suitable way to do so are only a few of a slew of copyrighted related issues that top the agenda of copyright police makers worldwide. In today's forum dedicated to an international discussion on such issues, Professor Mirasundra Rajan will provide an extensive overview on AI and copyright issues in keynote speech. We will then examine current creative technology and copyright related issues of generative AI through the range of industries and the right holders. Lastly, we'll hear about the efforts, policy efforts of the United States and the United Kingdom, Singapore and Korea to balance copyright protection with industrial development. In February, the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism and the Korea Copyright Commission established the AI Copyright Legal Framework Working Group with experts and stakeholders from the academia and drug legal community and AI industry and the creative sector in order to explore ways to improve the copyright regime as we enter the age of AI. In line with its endeavors, the working group will release the user guideline on AI and copyright this upcoming November. As Dr. Kim Hye Chang from our commission will provide a brief introduction to guideline today, we eagerly anticipate your insight and feedback during the forthcoming discussion session. I hope that this uh, Seoul Capital Forum will be an opportunity to derive Solomon's wisdom to protect the right of creators while fostering a harmonious development of the AI industry. Once again, I would like to thank all speakers, from, speakers and participants from home and abroad. And I especially wish that our participants from abroad will manage to get a good seasonal taste of Korea's beautiful autumn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman Choi, for your remarks. You have uh, delivered what meanings and discussions we will explore uh, during today's forum. I also wish that today we will be able to derive Solomon's wisdom altogether. Moving on. We will listen to the keynote speech that will deliver insights on the big topic. We have Professor Mira Sundara Rajan from UC Davis School of Law, and the presentation is titled AI and Copyright, What are the Questions at Issue and What Direction Should We Take for Answers? Please welcome Professor Rajan with a big round of applause.
Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to have this opportunity to speak to you today about one of the most interesting topics that has come up in relation to copyright law. In, in fact, in relation to just about everything, let's be honest, which is creative developments in artificial intelligence. And I would like to thank uh, all those involved in organizing this event for their very kind invitation and for the absolutely amazing efforts that they've gone to to welcome us, the speakers, to this country and uh, to make us feel comfortable here. This is my first visit to Korea and I already feel that I hope I will have many occasions to return. So thank you very, very much. When uh, I was asked to speak at this event, I was given this topic, which you see on the slide in front of you. AI and copyright, what are the questions at issue and what direction should we take for answers? So I promptly developed about 80 slides on various issues that I thought we should discuss and sent that uh, along to the team here. And uh, they very politely and delicately informed me that there would be 35 minutes generously allowed for my talk. Uh, so what, what I managed to do was to cut down the slides a little bit. And I will be skipping over a few of the slides today. But anyway, I've provided all of this material for your reference. And of course, when we have opportunity for questions and discussion, please feel free to bring up anything that you would like to ask about or discuss. And uh, I would be only too pleased to do so. So what are the questions at issue and what direction should we take for answers? So today, what I'm going to do is essentially start with some basics. Just consider for a few moments how and why artificial intelligence is a copyright issue. Secondly, review again very briefly what is the current position in copyright laws of the world. And of course, the speakers who will continue after me will be able to go into more depth on the various jurisdictions that they will be speaking about. But I will briefly consider the United States, the United Kingdom, and the European Union examples. Uh, I wanted also to speak about Canada and India, but I don't think we'll have time for that. So I'll just mention that there are some interesting points to discuss in relation to those countries as well, if you would like to follow up on those. And I will be looking at regulatory, policy, and legal approaches so far. I'm going to consider very briefly what we have learned from the experience to date, and I will particularly mention here some of the lawsuits, conflicts, and settlements that have turned up in the United States, with a particular focus on the Writers Guild of America and the ongoing conflict involving SAG-AFTRA. Finally, identify some key directions, and uh, last but not least, last but most in a sense, I will speak about the moral rights of authors and explain why I think this aspect of copyright law is absolutely key to everything that we're talking about when it comes to artificial intelligence. In fact, I have a very strong interest in moral rights and have been talking about this area for a long time, the moral rights aspect of copyright law as something that should be far more central in our discussions of technology. And what's happening with artificial intelligence, I think, only highlights those considerations. And just for your information, for those of you who, who may not yet be aware of that fact, I have done a book on the moral rights of authors with Oxford University Press. And a new edition of this book is now forthcoming. Just to highlight the relevance to our topic today, it will also have a new title, which is The Moral Rights of Authors and Artists, from the birth of copyright to the age of artificial intelligence. And so I would suggest that moral rights are very much part of an unheeded solution to the problems of AI regulation and making a small pun because the moral right of attribution is something many of you will be familiar with. I will say that moral rights are unattributed or uncredited as a possible solution for AI issues. So what is the state of the art right now, as far as AI is concerned? I think it's fair to say that this is a situation where there are many questions and few answers. Most countries, as of today, do not have legislative provisions dealing explicitly with AI creation. 
Those that do have such provisions, notably the UK, do not distinguish clearly between AI as an author and AI as an instrument of human creativity. And this is why I have the piano depicted on this slide, because here is an example of something else that is an instrument of human creativity. So a good point of comparison or departure perhaps for thinking about AI technology as a tool of human innovation. Common law countries so far are therefore heavily reliant on case law and in the United States on the complex and important area of fair use, leading to a fair degree of unpredictability when it comes to the future directions of AI. Interestingly, the role of copyright registration is also playing uh, a significant presence in terms of the path forward regarding AI. Copyright registration in other common law countries like Canada and India is also a phenomenon, although it doesn't have the same weight and significance as in the United States. So it's very interesting that registration is on the frontiers, uh, on the avant-garde of what's happening in the area of AI outside the United States. So just to say that at this stage of things, there's a lot of uncertainty, unpredictability, and asking the right questions, I think, is really key. So very briefly then, what exactly is the nexus between artificial intelligence and copyright? I think we can identify three fundamental issues here. First, there is the issue of copyright in underlying computer code, which is a well-established area, the principle of copyright protection for computer programs, very well established. But we quickly move into areas of greater uncertainty. Secondly, copyright in works generated by or with AI. This presents a great conundrum, of course, in relation to copyright, because here we're talking about traditional copyright subject matter, copyright works, but the means by which they are produced are different. And finally, the whole question of infringement, as was already hinted by uh, Director Choi. Copyright in works that are used to train AI. Do we have an infringement problem and what do we intend to do about it? Let's turn right away to the question of works generated by or with AI. Traditionally, as we all know, copyright is held by authors. Authors are the initial holders of copyright in almost all systems of the world. And the reason why copyright works that way is in order to provide incentives, incentives for creation, and secondly, to offer protection to the authors who create works. This leads to some fundamentally important questions that transcend copyright law. Questions about truth, first of all. Who actually is the creator of the work? Because that person is the intended beneficiary of copyright protections. And secondly, related issue, of course, is that of justice. Who should benefit from copyright rules? Regarding AI, again, as I mentioned before, we are currently in the realm of policy making, and most of the points that I'm going to discuss today aren't settled law anywhere. So this is a very exciting time, exciting for Korea, I would say, because you are in a position not only to establish policy, but also to exercise international leadership. In terms of key copyright issues related to AI, there are many points that we could discuss. Again, our time being limited, I won't go into all of them, but I did want to just quickly mention what some of the key issues are. First of all, as I've started to speak about authorship, and we'll go into in more detail in the course of this discussion. The concept of originality, copyright extending only to the protection of original works, is again something fundamentally important to copyright law, clearly involved in AI, as you will see uh, going forward in this presentation. Fair use or fair dealing, to what extent are our dealings with existing copyright works in the context of AI going to connect with the concepts of US fair use or fair dealing in many other countries? The question of consent, 
what are authors consenting to, what are copyright owners consenting to in terms of the use of their works in the AI context? This is a very important question that transcends copyright and takes us more into the areas of contract negotiating and of course the ever-present question of inequality of bargaining power, which we're always facing when it comes to authorship and copyright and technology for that matter. Then moral rights, the somewhat uh, new topic, I hope, or less trodden ground that you're going to be hearing about from me today. How do the concepts of attribution of authorship and the protection of the integrity of copyright works play into our dealings with copyright and AI? And of course, underlying all of this, I think is a concern that we see discussed quite a bit, discussed enormously in the media, potential for abuse, and particularly the abuse of humans through AI technology. So it's a powerful technology with both positives and negatives. What is the current position in some of the example countries that I would like to speak about today? Here's a very quick overview. So in the United States, as I'm sure we'll be hearing much more about throughout the day, no copyright subsists in works created by AI. That is the current position. In the UK, a rather different situation. There is a limited term of protection for 50 years held by the creator of the artificial intelligence technology. Okay, the language of the statute is the person who puts in place the arrangements by which the creation occurs. In other countries of interest in my presentation, there is no legislation. In common law countries, as I mentioned, we've seen some test cases through attempted copyright registration of work created by AI, notably in India and Canada. And I'll quickly say that those efforts have not been very successful. So, so far, a rejection in those two countries. In the European Union, and currently in the UK, there's something else important, which is dealings with text and data mining which of course goes to the whole question of training artificial intelligence. Text and data mining in these jurisdictions by corporations is currently not allowed. It is only allowed for nonprofits and universities. So our point of departure is that AI, which uses these works beyond the limitations in those jurisdictions, will amount to an infringing activity which will not be eligible for copyright protection. Now that's only our point of departure, not a prediction about the future, as you will see in a few minutes. And finally, in the European Union, there's a comprehensive AI Act in development, which is moving forward almost every day. But I will give a very quick overview of some of the fundamentals of what's happening in the EU, again, which I'm sure we'll hear more about throughout the day today. So in the United States, let's begin with our basic position, which is that human authorship is required. And our source for this information is the compendium of US copyright office practices, which clarifies the interpretation of US copyright legislation. And I think this image of the monkey selfie will be familiar to many people. Uh, this was uh, an incident that generated some response from the United States Copyright Office, among others. Uh, I'll just point out for a few moments here the key language that appears in the compendium, which is very useful for us to think about in relation to AI. They talk about protecting the fruits of intellectual labor that are founded in the creative powers of the mind. They discuss the original intellectual conceptions of the author. And to qualify as a work of authorship, a work must be created by a human being. Very straightforward. The US Copyright Office will not register works produced by nature, animals, <laughs> or plants. Likewise, the office cannot register a work purportedly created by divine or supernatural beings, although the office may register a work where the application states that the work was inspired by a divine spirit. So very interesting language and I think highlights some of the subtleties involved in trying to determine whether or not something qualifies as a work of human authorship eligible for copyright protection. 
always grateful to the Copyright Office for these clarifications. The compendium also specifically states, the office will not register works produced by a machine or mere mechanical process that operates randomly or automatically without any creative input or intervention from a human author. The crucial question is whether the work is basically one of human authorship. Specifically, whether the traditional elements of authorship were actually conceived and executed by man as opposed to machine. I wanted to give uh, very briefly uh, an example of an artificial intelligence work for which Stephen Thaler attempted to register a copyright. And you can see the work, a reproduction of the work in the image there. It's described as a simulated near-death experience where an algorithm repurposes pictures to create images seen by a synthetic dying brain. Thaler noted to the United States Copyright Office that he was seeking to register this computer-generated work as a work for hire to the owner of the creativity machine. So no discussion of authorship actually, leaving us wondering who is the underlying author. In the event, the United States Copyright Office wasn't disposed to look upon this favorably. What did Thaler's attorney have to say about that? We disagree with the Copyright Office's decision and plan to appeal. AI is able to make functionally creative output in the absence of a traditional human author, and protecting AI-generated works with copyright is vital to promoting the production of socially valuable content. And then the attorney goes on to say, providing this protection is required under current legal frameworks. What is meant by this emphasis on socially valuable content and existing legal frameworks? We need to turn somewhere outside the US Copyright Act for this uh, to a very interesting place, the United States Constitution. And I think it's worth our while to have a look at this language for a moment, the famous intellectual property clause of the Constitution, which enables Congress to enact IP regulation to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. But please notice that this clause focuses on authorship. This is an aspect of US copyright law that is often fudged by the legal community. But I think that this language potentially presents a real impediment to recognizing AI works as copyright subject matter in the United States. In the arguments that we saw from Thaler's attorney, he talks about the progress aspect of underlying policy rationales for copyright in the United States without taking authorship into account. Now, we are moving into a universe, as I started to hint at the beginning of this presentation, where we need to think in a lot more depth about the relationship between human creators and artificial intelligence tools. And here's a very nice quote that expresses that idea from a United States judge, who points out that we are approaching new frontiers in copyright as artists put AI in their toolbox. And I'd like to consider an example of just that situation where an artist has used AI as part of their toolbox in the creation of a very interesting composite work, which again, I'm sure we'll hear more about throughout the day today. But this is the example of Zarya of the Dawn, a work which had text written by a human author, Kristina Kastanova, combined with images generated by AI in response to a series of prompts. The initial copyright registration for the work as a whole was revoked by the Copyright Office. And the finding was that the text was copyrightable, but the images were not, because, as we've just seen, they were not the work of a human author, and that is expressly not within the compass of United States copyright law. 
What happened in this case provides much food for thought. I'll highlight a few key points that have occurred to me. Interestingly, the use of prompts by Kushinova did not lead to copyright subject matter. Neither of the images nor of the prompts themselves. Because the process of creation was not controlled by the user. But Kushinova did gain a copyright. It was a copyright in the compilation that they had created, which included both the images and the text, although the images were not entitled to copyright protection in their own right. Composite works in some ways could be considered the typical or prototypical work of the digital environment. And here we see the idea of the compilation coming up and becoming eligible for copyright, even with AI involvement. And I think that this finding is both insightful and extremely interesting because we see that there is an incentivization involved. The use of AI is incentivized by making the compilations protectable by copyright, not by making the images directly protectable themselves. Does this also incentivize the uncredited use of artificial intelligence within larger works? I think that this is possible and it's something that we should be concerned about. Because in the United States, there is no general requirement of attribution under US copyright law. But it seems important that these incorporated elements in copyright works should be identified and identifiable as AI creations, even if they are not directly protected by copyright. In the case of Kashtanova, they also could not gain copyright protection of the edited versions of those images because they were not sufficiently original, going back to one of our fundamental copyright concepts. I was very intrigued to see the response of Max Sills, Midjourney's general counsel, to all of these developments, which actually was not what I had expected and uh, he described the Copyright Office decision as a great victory, noting that it demonstrated a willingness to reward the efforts of those who utilize AI, such as Midjourney, in their creative process. So this whole idea of AI as an instrument of human creativity gaining some traction, recognized by Max in these comments. I won't uh, spend the time to discuss the work for hire element of Kashtanova, but again, glad to deal with that in questions or discussion. Let's move forward and consider now the question of infringement. Infringement in the training of AI and the issues involved in bringing fair use or fair dealing reasoning into these questions. The fair use doctrine, better to say up front what I think many of us feel in our hearts, that uh, this is one of the most difficult, or you might say the most troublesome doctrine in the whole law of US copyright. And it's always helpful, I think, to bear in mind the purpose of fair use as well. It's a key instrument of copyright policy, of course, whose goal is to balance the monopoly of the copyright owner against the right of the public to use the works during the copyright term. Once the copyright term is over, we no longer have to worry about any of this. But during the term, there's a, a powerful struggle going on and fair use is there in order to help us to balance the different interests involved. So how is fair use likely to play into the developments that are happening in terms of AI? And of course, the question that's on everyone's mind has to do with scraping, scraping the internet. Uh, using large quantities of works that are available for the purpose of training generative AI. Is it, will it be deemed one day a fair use? And in United States copyright law, section 107 of the act tells us that there are four factors that we need to weigh in order to determine whether or not something should be considered a fair use, a permissible use of works that are still within the term of copyright protection. One of the important factors involves whether economic harm is generated to holders of the copyright in those works. 
And typically what we see is that economic harm to authors and artists in this case will need to be weighed against the idea of transformative use, which has become extraordinarily important in US law. So are we using these technologies to create something so truly innovative, something so truly removed, in fact, from the original context of the works, that we should recognize this as a fair use? And truth be told regarding fair use, as I have already begun to state in this presentation, there is a fair degree of unpredictability, in spite of the usefulness of the four-factor framework outlined in the US Copyright Act and the various precedents that we're dealing with. In fact, what we see, if we trace the line of precedent, is that there are cultural pendulum swings. In 2021, there was an important development with the Google versus Oracle case, which many of you will be familiar with, where we seem to see an opening up towards the idea of fair use and the permissibility of using works for technological developments in that particular sector. But then, the following year, there was another swing of the pendulum in Warhol versus Goldsmith, where we were dealing specifically with the question of fair use of artworks. And here, the Supreme Court restricted fair use when it comes to the unlicensed use of artworks. So the pendulum seems to have swung in that direction as of now. And I think that if that direction continues, we may be in a universe where scraping ends up being found unacceptable, so more of an infringement of copyright rather than a possible fair use. And I think that overall, this prediction, which may or may not end up being uh, truthful, like all predictions, but this informed prediction of the moment does seem in keeping with a certain zeitgeist where there is a lot of resistance to uh, the creative development of AI technology uh, amongst the creative industries and copyright holders. Uh, for example, the situation we're seeing in Hollywood now with very high profile strikes of both writers communities and actors and performers communities with great concerns about the possible impact of AI on them and public responsiveness to those objections. So a zeitgeist where concerns about AI right now are playing into our understanding of fair use as well. In fact, let's speak for a moment longer about the specific situation in Hollywood because we have two different kinds of creative communities that have been very concerned about AI in the past several months. Writers' communities on the one hand and actors, performers on the other. Both communities went on strike, as all of you would probably know. But the writer's strike was recently settled. And the settlement in itself is a very interesting development because in some ways the terms of the settlement may actually have preempted copyright reform in the United States, at least in part. And they may also help to inform reform and legislative initiatives elsewhere, outside the United States, of course. So what are some of the things that happened in the writer's settlement? And I'm going to quote from uh, various sources here. So first of all, just a general report about the writer's contract. Very interesting. It does not outlaw the use of AI tools in the writing process, but it sets up guardrails to make sure the new technology stays in the control of workers, a key issue for the writers, rather than being used by their bosses to replace them, a key fear of writers and of uh, creators more broadly in relation to AI. The writer's solution, I think, also hints at some of the connections between AI and moral rights. So while the new union contract allows writers to use the tools if they want to and if the companies agree, writers cannot be forced to use AI technology and there's an attribution principle involved. Companies have to disclose whenever they give writers materials to work with that has been generated by AI tools, whether independently, primarily, or exclusively generated by those tools. I would actually call this a moral rights solution. 
attribution of authorship is being called upon, not in terms of individual attribution of authors, but in terms of identifying whether or not AI is a creator or co-creator of the work. And I would say that in a sense, this agreement is typical of the United States when it comes to moral rights, because we don't have moral rights for writers in American copyright legislation, as I've mentioned previously, but there are requirements, extensive requirements on credit attribution, as well as integrity issues in guild contracts in Hollywood. So it is the private ordering solution, the contractual solution to moral rights and suggests the soft power of those who work in the creative industries in Hollywood. Simon Johnson, an economist, points out that the writer's contract terms are very smart, as he puts it, because they allow writers to, to choose to use AI as a research tool without undermining either credit or compensation that they receive. So again, moral rights are being hinted at here. It's not only about compensation, it's also about that issue of attribution. AI, again, is under the control of writers, not just the studios. It's complementary to humans. And the union win on AI is also not a loss for the studios. Johnson suggests, since they will get a better product from the arrangement than they might have otherwise. And I think this is a very important point that we don't often see discussed, which is, what is the nature of the products created by the AI technologies? What is it that the public wants? And here's another statement from a professor of computer science, speaking about the process behind AI and the product that's generated. AI models, he says, require human beings to keep feeding it for these AI models to get better. So unless there's cooperation, you can only do so much to cannibalize your own data source. And then this key point, when these AI models start to hurt the very people who generate the data that they feed on, the artists, they're destroying their own future. So it is in the best interest of AI models and model creators to help to preserve these creative industries so that there is a sustainable cycle of creativity. So when it comes to actors and musicians, performers, they also have been up in arms about AI, but we're seeing the same technology with different uses and deeper implications in many ways for this community. It's been called a lightning rod issue and the primary concern that has been raised is the use of digital likenesses. In essence, an AI double that productions could hire instead of a real actor. And this has been referred to as literally dehumanizing the workforce, taking a person out and replacing that person with an AI image. Oh, I'm sorry, there's actually a, a slide uh, missing here. Um, I'll, simply, uh, I'll simply cover the material. So uh, the point that I wanted to make here is that attribution for actors takes us into, I think, perfect, thank you. Attribution for actors takes us into a more serious issue, that is, we start to understand some of the problems involved here as matters of human rights. Otherwise, we're talking about something akin to a kind of professional identity theft. And not only is it that the careers of actors and performers might be ruined, literally, by removing them from uh, productions, but also reputations may be ruined in the process by what the AI likeness may do in the place of the person and may create an impression about the person uh, based on the AI. So I think something to notice here is that a right to opt out is key. And such a right must be exercised as far as possible in free bargaining conditions. So here again, just to highlight uh, the role of guild contracts, there's something important to be accomplished through contract law here. And Hollywood is clearly the initial 
testing ground for many of these developments. Let's talk briefly in the remaining time uh, about the United Kingdom, another country where uh, there are some very interesting points to consider. The UK has recently had a consultation on AI and IP where they've considered both copyright and patents. And they're asking the questions as follows. They're, they're pointing out that copyright protection for computer generated works is currently recognized in the UK Act, but should they be protected at all? The UK Copyright Office is asking, and if so, how should they be protected? In response, they say they have identified actions to consult on how far copyright and patents should protect the creative and inventive works made by AI. And they're also committed, they say, to consulting on measures to make it easier for AI to use copyright protected material. And finally, their key ambition is to encourage innovation in the AI sector and, they say, to promote its use for the public good. They say also that finding a balance is fundamentally important to them. They want to preserve the central role of IP in promoting human creativity and innovation. So where have they gone with these objectives? What are their plans? Well, as far as computer-generated works are concerned, they say that they're not planning any changes to the law, that they don't anticipate any harm, although they might change their minds at any point. Fair enough. But when it comes to text and data mining, they've moved much further ahead. They say that they plan to introduce a new copyright and database exception, allowing TDM for any purpose. But, they say, right holders will still have safeguards to protect their content. What will those safeguards be? Well, right holders will not be able to contract or opt out of the exception, so opting out is not one of the safeguards. Instead, the main safeguard will be the requirement for lawful access. So right holders may choose the platform where they will make their works available, including charging for access. And the UK government says they will also be able to take measures to ensure the integrity and security of their systems. The government's ambition, they say, is to make the UK a global center for AI innovation. All users of data mining technology will benefit, with right holders having safeguards to protect their content. So essentially what we're seeing is a plan for a transition from a limited TDM exception to a universal exception. This, it must be said, is a strong contrast to the EU and to the US so far as well. But it leads to a slightly strange situation because uh, AI-generated works are also protectable by copyright in the UK, as we've just seen. So, are we actually providing the right incentives? This balance does favor AI creators above other creators. Uh, is it good for society? Is it ultimately good for AI innovation? These are questions that remain to be answered. Um, if I may have another couple of minutes, I would like to conclude just with a very brief uh, reflection on the moral rights aspect of these points. I'd like to say a few more words about moral rights before concluding because this may be a unique opportunity for many of you to get introduced to the moral rights dimension of all that we've been talking about in relation to AI. And as I said at the beginning, I think that once we get into the universe of moral rights, we're speaking about much broader social issues. We're talking about concerns that people have in terms of AI undermining reality, history, identity, truth, and of course questions about human creativity. So what is at stake here could not be any larger. And the concern I think that many people have, either uh, overtly or subconsciously, is a fear about technology becoming weaponized, not only to destroy human livelihoods, but to strike uh, at our humanity at a deeper level, 
to affect our human creativity by discouraging it in favor of AI creation. And as I've pointed out at several uh, stages during this presentation, that is a loss to everyone, including those who create AI technology. So my suggested solution is let's instead do what some organizations, some people are starting to do and treat AI as a tool of human creativity instead. In the future, I think that it will be important to know the answer to basic questions such as how a work is created and who or what is the author of that creation. Is it a human being? Is it an AI? Is it some combination of the two? Quality of life reasons are an important factor to consider in this regard. We need to be able to do things like acknowledge and recognize the biases inherent in AI, understand and respect the differences in human and AI creative capabilities. We need to maintain human brain health and also develop human education. Moral rights are protected in the Berne Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works. They are therefore a part of the fundamental fabric of copyright protections in every country in the world. In the United States, there is limited protection of moral rights, but nevertheless, they are also present in American copyright law. What then should happen to moral rights when AI is involved? I think that we need to see protection of the attribution and integrity of authors being maintained as a key part of what happens in this environment going forward. And it should be something that occurs across all areas of human creativity. We are going to come across new acts which should, I think, be recognized as new forms of moral rights violations. For example, the use of the names of living authors in prompts to image generators. Uh, scraping from the internet. These are violations of both attribution and integrity that are appearing in new technological forms. But I would go a step further and also say that moral rights should be treated as a new template for new kinds of rights in works. Rights that enable us to distinguish AI from human creation, to indicate when and how AI is used as a tool, as an instrument of human creativity, and of course, to protect both the reputations and the livelihoods of authors and, and artists. And of course, those interests are intertwined, reputational and economic interests. So am I saying that we could have moral rights without authors? Well, yes, I think I am. We can call it that, or we can also consider it a new moral right of identification, for example. And I will quickly say that it is not unprecedented to take moral rights theories into these new forms and areas. In fact, both Korea and Japan have done so already in their copyright laws in a different context by recognizing a potential moral right for corporations. We also see new developments in moral rights uh, related interests in Europe, for example, through the press publisher's right, which is a copyright innovation in European law. So are there options for more creative thinking when it comes to moral rights? I think there are. It is a flexible and adaptable doctrine. So my conclusion then is let's approach all of this like humans. Let's be creative and let's use the creative potential inherent in copyright law expressed uh, in many ways through the doctrine of the moral rights of authors and artists and through those foundational principles of attribution of knowledge and preserving the integrity of knowledge, which will be so helpful to us, I think, moving forward into the world of artificial intelligence creativity. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much. 네, 좋은 말씀 잘 들었습니다. Thank you very much. Uh, so you ended your presentation uh, with the words, let's approach like human beings. Thank you so much. That was very um, inspiring. And you've also talked about the some of the main copyright related issues pertaining to artificial intelligence. Uh, so moral rights. Yes, uh, you have talked about the importance of moral rights and how we can approach it from that kind of lens. Let's another give a round, round of another big round of applause for um, Professor uh, Rajan. And so we're now going to take a 10 minute break and then we're going to go on to topic number one. So please enjoy your break and see you back in about 10 minutes. Thank you. 네, 여러분, 짧지만.
I hope you enjoyed your uh, brief coffee break. Now we will begin the first session of the Seoul Copyright Forum 2023. The topic of the session is current status of generative AI's creation technology and relevant copyright issues. We will follow the most recent uh, trend of AI in Korea and we will uh, look at the topic from the perspective of the industry and that of the right holder. The presentation to kick off the session will be delivered by senior research engineer Han Yu Ko of AI Lab LG Electronics. Please welcome him with a big round of applause. Good morning. I am Han Kyu Ko, Senior Research Engineer at LG Electronics AI Lab. As introduced, I will cover the advancements in generative AI uh, technology and domestic cases in my presentation, uh, covering the recent trends and the future direction of technological advancement in the sector, and also I will share my perspective as a member of the AI industry on the copyright issues in regard to generative AI. I am not here to represent my company, but just to share my thoughts as an industry member. So to begin the presentation, I would like to cover the very basic concepts such as what AI or deep learning is. Generative AI is a type of AI technology and AI technology is defined as those that can see, think, and listen and act as human beings. So these are computer programs. And one of the methods that realize this AI technology is the deep learning method that is almost replacing AI. I searched up the definition of generative AI, and it is well known through examples such as ChatGPT or MidJourney and other such popular AI services, be it document, text, or image, or computer codes. Generative AI is the technology that can generate a various works. The first time AI was widely known among the general public was back in 2016 at one event that took place in Seoul. With reinforcement learning, AlphaGo learned how to play the game of Go, and one of the most famous players of Korea, Sado Lee, was pitted against AlphaGo. It garnered much national attention, like a World Cup event, but the result of the games were shocking. The program became further advanced and even defeated the world champion. And the top ranked Game of Go technologies are AI models and they are outperforming uh, the most well known players. So AI solved a problem by exploring numerous possibilities or probabilities, and it implied uh, to many people how AI may outperform human beings in solving such problems going forward. But afterwards, there wasn't a very visible uh, progress. Although research continues, 
in the field of reinforcement learning, the applications are limited to those that can be simulated via computer. That's where its strength lied, but application to real world problems uh, was not a very feasible option. So the human beings need to provide the basic sketches and the AI technologies that can really enhance productivity uh, began to garner more attention. So rather than reinforcement learning, again, came to the fore. So these are technologies that can make fake outputs that seem real. So rather than problem solving, creating new things was a feature of AI uh, that garnered more focus. Such technologies greatly advanced, and now uh, such GAN AI technology can make a very believable uh, face of a human being. Stable diffusion is a similar uh, application to this technology, but there are slight differences. Uh, the scan is the more earlier uh, type of AI. Then comes the second impact, uh, the chat GPT's emergence. Earlier this year, I think many of us got a chance to explore this application but it was actually published in November 2022. Users have seen exponential growth. TikTok took nine months to acquire 100 million monthly users, but it only took two months for ChatGPT. It shows what a dramatic emergence it made and how ChatGPT was able to deliver uh, usable uh, results and outputs for many users. But the basis of ChatGPT is, in fact, a language model called GPT-3 that was published earlier. It was published in 2020 by OpenAI, and it is the prime case of a language model. The method or the working principle is simple. The transformer is largely defined and text collected from numerous volume of text is learned and based on that it codes, writes, makes apps and can do many different things. So this is almost the origin of the foundation model type of generative AI technology. It translates, creates applications, writes um, short texts, and also does coding. These are all applications uh, that were demonstrated to be available with the GPT-3 model. And based off of ChatGPT-3, it leads to the arrival of ChatGPT. Language model seems to be capable of many things, but there was a need for a conversational AI and something that can give decent answers to questions. So this required additional training. So a GPT version uh, for conversational use was developed, which was the ChatGPT. And Shortly after GPT-4 was released, of course, the language model and capacity itself was enhanced. But what was even more noteworthy for me was that not only text but even image uh, input uh, was pr processed by uh, GPT-4. So if Text prompts were given, outputs would come out, but not only that, photographs could be used as prompts, which uh, the user could use to ask questions and be delivered answers. So this was the difference than the earlier version. The version for the general public was recently released, and it's dubbed GPT-4. So 
the language model uh, related leading in companies and their histories uh, was just covered. And even in Korea, after GPT-3, many domestic companies focused on this area and started focusing on language model among uh, Gen AI technology. Uh, mostly Naver, LG, which is the company that I'm affiliated in, and SK, and not only such conglomerates, but even startups began entering uh, this realm of technological development. Companies such as Naver, in fact, has a business with the largest Korean language model. And other companies also have their own strategies and uh, focus and took a stab at technological advancement. To explain more about LG, my company, back in 2021, we developed and published Excel One, which is a language model. It is short for expert AI for everyone, basically. AI for everyone, which is our mo motto. I am from the AI lab, but Excel One was released by LG AI Research. So the AI lab that I work in uh, works for the LG Electronics branch, but LG AI Research is for LG Chemical, LG Display, LG Petrochemical, and basically AI technology for a larger range of applications. And they released XL1 in 2021. Compared to GPT-4, it perhaps highlighted the multi-modality of uh, generative AI, which makes it special. So the model that was released in 2021 could take in both image and text prompts and was able to answer questions. And as you can see, the size of the model, model it, it was even uh, larger in scale than uh, GPT-3, uh, which was the state-of-the-art model at the time. And it was able to show state-of-the-art performance. The goal of XA1 was slightly different than other search engine portals such as Naver or Google, but it was more oriented towards professional applications and domain-specific applications that could be used in our company. That was the original intention behind its development. So. It was more focused on academic journals or patent-related information so that it could be used to get ideas for development of new materials for manufacturing and other professional purposes. So compared to GPT or BARD or more general use language models, it had a more specific purpose. purpose. After 2021, additional progress was made, and this year, uh, July version 2 was released. Data quality was enhanced, and in LLM or multimodal perspective, the memory efficiency and capability was enhanced, and depending on the specific purpose, it has three different types, X01 Universe, X01 Discovery, and X01 Atelier, each of which are the more specialized model for a certain domain. For X01 Universe, learned based on academic uh, papers, so it can answer questions based on factual information. The biggest problem with language models is hallucination. So this model uh, is foolproof when it comes to such uh, downside. And X01 discovery 
is intended to be used for simulating new drugs and testing of new drug candidates in one of uh, LG's affiliates. And XL1 Atelier is the more general use uh, version where we can ask recommendations for some captions that could be used for our advertisements or creation of images. There is, of course, Universe and the Discovery version, but Atelier uh, would be uh, suitable for uh, the general uh, broader range of purposes. So if you input a photo and ask for an appropriate caption, then you can use that to make a post on your uh, social media account. Not only that, when it comes to the Korean language model data, uh, base Naver has the biggest scale uh, language data, and they announced uh, in 2021 their uh, model named Hyperclova, and its special feature is that it has the most number of Korean tokens uh, for training its model, which makes the model uh, its capacity superior than other language Korean language models out there. It can create data and hold conversation based on content. And this year's August, the upgraded version Hyperclova X was released. Compared to the first version, Hyperclova X is oriented towards the more expert data. Hyperclova can, of course, be used by the general public, but energy, education, finance, or other domain-specific uh, model can be found in this Hyperclova X, which is further fine-tuned. And this was released this year in August. So EXA1 or Hyperclova X, among well, they do not represent all of the uh, Gen AI models developed in Korea, but when it comes to language model, these companies defined the model from the scratch and collected all of the data used for its training. So these language models were developed from the scratch by domestic companies, and they are the most representative cases. These language models can be used not only for conversation, but various applications, as I've mentioned. So the significance of Gen AI is as a foundation model. Uh, and in cases of GPT or XL1, not only text, but images can be used as prompts. And other types of input, such as audio or sensor, modality can be taken in as prompt input and such multimodal prompts can be processed to be used for various applications and this is the picture that I expect to see in the near future and I added this slide to emphasize the importance of multimodality as our orientation for the future. And based on the multimodality concept, many articles and papers are being published. Meta AI is the new name for Facebook. So the Facebook's AI branch released many papers, and there is one on the topic of multimodality. It says that not only image or text, but various sensor data can be used as uh, input and be aligned in an embedded space, which means we are not confined to text as prompts, but 
images or audio uh, can be put in to retrieve the results or output that we are looking for. The recently released version of ChatGPT shows expanded capacity. ChatGPT 4 can take images as prompts for a simple Q&A, but going beyond, ChatGPT can listen to your voice as a prompt, and it could also uh, deliver uh, audio output. Although GPT was trained only based on text, but the range is now expanding to include image, audio, and other forms of input. When we do coding, Copilot, of course, helps us code if we give them a text prompt of the feature that we want, but now we can give them audio input. Then the foundation model will deliver the codes that the engineers need. So this is the era that we are entering into at this critical juncture. Such a generative AI is giving rise to many copyright issues that I'm sure you are all familiar with. The image on the left is a photograph that was sourced from Getty Images and a model that learned on licensed images in Getty Images generated an image output that even has a slightly distorted version of the Getty Image logo. This is a copyright issue because it is due to the method of training the AI that is uh, based on the patterns. So all of the Gen AI technology are bound to have this problem. Not only images, but coding is also vulnerable to this problem. Uh, if a prompt was given to Copilot to generate a code, the result was almost identical to the code that was used to train this model. And this uh, led to a lawsuit, which is still ongoing. So the legal framework or social consensus is still elusive, but technological advancement is outpacing uh, sufficient social consensus. So if you search up news articles with regard to companies that release AI technologies, usually the provider of the data are contracted uh, under a license agreement so that they can avoid uh, copyright issues in the future. And when we released EXA1 model, we wanted to reinforce it uh, by training it on more expert and specialized data. So be it patent-related papers, or when it comes to the atelier version, they need to take both image and text as prompts. So if you look at the bottom uh, right, we use uh, data from Shutterstock to train the model on images. So we, in advance, signed license agreements with these data sources. So that training data used for our models will be completely cl cleared of any legal uh, issues. And we are seeing other trends 
and developments in the industry to avoid copyright issues. I think this slide shows images that was generated uh, from Midjourney, and we have a speaker from Midjourney today. So these images could be abused for fake news or disinformation. So as people explored how to protect the copyright of the owners and authors of such images, relevant research has been uh, conducted. And steganography is a technology that could be applied for Gen AI image outputs. And it puts the synth ID, which is not visible to human eye, but can be processed by AI on these images. It is a sort of pattern that cannot be detected with the human naked eye, but by the AI, making the AI outputs uh, distinguishable from the original images. But such technological solutions will not be sufficient from my point of view. I explained the multimodality solutions and perhaps they can be applied to images, but when it comes to texts, we cannot apply the steganography solution. Perhaps this is possible for audio, a frequency that human ears cannot detect, but AI may be able to detect the frequency so they could sort of incorporate such uh, notice that it was generated by AI. But we will need to compensate with other types of solutions. So exploring the legal issues and the technical issues and the social co consensus challenge, such exploration will require a lot of cooperation and conversation and discourse on multimodality. And as an industry member working on AI development, of course, technology itself is important. Most of the recent uh, generative AI depends on transformer and deep learning and the hardware used for uh, deep learning such as GPU, CPU, and cloud computing. No matter how advanced the technology is or the model that is in use is, the, if the data used for their training is of subpar quality and insufficient in terms of scale, the output of the AI will be low in terms of quality. So as an AI researcher, I am aware of the significance of the data quality. So most of my day work consists of switching models and training them, but also what comes in a, uh, before, prior to that step. So collecting data to be used for training, filtering out uh, erroneous data and pre-processing the data. That takes up almost half of what I do. And once we have a quality AI model, then wh whose contribution is bigger, the AI technology or the data? I would say 50-50. So in that light, the outstanding Gen AI models such as ChatGPT, Midjourney, Bar, Cloud. Of course, they required a lot of effort from their developers, but also they owe much to the data that was collected by many people, which is also a form of collective intelligence, in my view. And the AI technology is a technological basket that can encompass such collective wisdom and data is the ingredient that fills that basket. So the rights of the owners of such data 
should be respected. And those who enable that data to be used as training data. So in other words, the contributors to the collection and uh, processing of that data should be credited in order to create a virtual cycle. This was pointed out also in the keynote speech. Without data, we have no fuel. Without no new data, then we will not be able to develop new AI models. Technology and data and the relevant stakeholders of both sides need to be adequately compensated if we are to see a virtual cycle in AI development in the near future. So on that last note, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for your elucidating uh, presentation. Mr. Ko touched upon the AI development trends in Korea that is happening at a world level pace. And fuel for AI technology data and the owners of the data should be fully compensated uh, according to his presentation. So thank you for your insights. And as Mr. Ko introduced, of course, the AI technology of Korea are outstanding, but the unquestioned leader of AI technology these days is the United States. So the rapid technological advancement and the legal discourse surrounding AI technology is uh, taking place in none other than the US. So uh, we will be able to hear a voice from the industries uh, from the US on AI and copyright. We would like to welcome uh, General Counsel Maxwell Sills from Mid Journey. Why don't we welcome him with a big round of applause for his presentation. Mr. Maxwell Sills from Mid Journey. Um, I'm so grateful to be invited here. Thank you to the chairman and the Ministry of Culture. Um, we had a terrific dinner last night, all the speakers. I didn't expect it. Um, I was extremely jet lagged and I just wanted to go to sleep, but it was wonderful, this kind of unexpected meeting of a bunch of different perspectives in a very relaxed setting. And I'm really appreciative of that. Um, so I'm Max Sills. I'm the general counsel of Midjourney. I also run a law firm and consulting practice for other AI companies. And what we do is we think about domestic and international expansion. So we look at markets where you might want to expand to. And we think about, um, mostly my job is trying to predict the future. What might happen? good and bad when you go into a new market. Um, just trying to think through a little bit of what has already been discussed today. I'm not going to advocate for a certain position that the law should be one way or another, or that policy should be one way or another, because I think that the other speakers today make, that, make those arguments better than I could. Instead, I want to give you a slightly different approach, which is this concept of interjurisdictional competition for businesses. Um, so obviously, South Korea is an extremely promising market, both for domestic AI businesses and for uh, foreign companies. There's clear global demand, extreme education pipeline, long history of innovation, and AI is just making things go faster and faster. But let's take this different perspective for a moment. So when we're talking about things like it's important that creators get compensated, we need to discuss fair use. We need to discuss attribution. What are we trying to optimize for? Why do we have copyright law at all to begin with? So our keynote speaker gave us the US perspective where it's constitutional. The idea is to improve society. If we give to creative people the limited rights to prevent others 
from, at, from using their material, the idea is that will make them happy and incentivize them to create more creative works. I just want us to keep in the back of the mind, in the back of our mind, what are we trying to optimize for when we pass regulation? Do we have a sound and fundamental principle that we're trying to solve for? Or are we being led by different constituencies? Today someone says they want this, tomorrow someone says they want something else. What is the point of passing laws? So I want to suggest this kind of concept of market for IP law. We live in a global marketplace. Korean domestic companies don't have to start here. They can go somewhere else. And foreign companies can come here. In fact, there's definitely perspective that there's something correct and right that needs to be done to address social harms. But there's also this perspective that law is a product. And Korea has IP laws that it sells to its own domestic and international customers, as do other jurisdictions. And you're in a giant international competition to sell laws that balance protecting consumers with maximizing the economy and also optimizing other objectives like maximizing the most creativity. We want to see the most creativity possible. So I just want to say here, I'm not talking about a race to the bottom because someone, you could say, well, maybe the best policies for companies are ones where there are no rules. You could just come, pollute, pay no taxes. Um, that's what's known as a race to the bottom. That's not what I'm suggesting. Because when you treat people with respect and dignity and act in a just fashion, that is compatible with making more money. A happy market that has privacy rights, property rights, and a good strong licensing market where people understand their roles can breed both societal good and economic opportunity. The only thing that is definitely bad is uncertainty. So for the rest of my talk, I want you to think about this from a policymaker's perspective. The law can be anything. There's a theorem in economics called Coase theorem, which suggests that if two parties have equal bargaining power, they're just going to do a deal to transact that property to its highest use anyway. And in that sense, the law doesn't, when we make laws or regulations, we don't really get to tell people what we do, what to do. Instead, sometimes, it's more like business is a stream and we're just dropping a pebble in the stream with our regulations. But we, the stream will move around the pebble and there might be unintended consequences. So I want to th think about that. But this, this, let's think about the perspective of a company that is deciding to participate in this competition between two jurisdictions for laws. And I really like the dinner we had last night. I think this is a perfect metaphor for interjurisdictional competition. Have you ever tried to throw a dinner party? Okay, some. Some people. I get very nervous whenever I have to throw a dinner party because I want everyone to have a good time. I also have to go cook, and that makes me nervous too. And what if they say they're going to come, but then they don't come? Um, it's a very magical thing, a good dinner party. You don't really have control over everything. You have control over the small pieces that you can do. You can send the invitations, you can cook, but when we're talking about interjurisdictional competition, companies have many dinners to go to. They're invited to many different dinner parties. How do they decide which one to go to? Both domestic and international companies. So I'm going to give you some math. And don't take this as the exact truth, but hope it can be used to give you some reasoning about why a company might choose to go to one dinner party over another dinner party. 
So here we have this concept of discounted cash flow analysis. Has anyone heard of this concept? Good, everyone has heard of this concept. Um, what, what we're saying here is, when a company decides to enter into either business A or business B, or market A or market B, first it tries to figure out how much money will either opportunity make. This is very basic. The reason it's called discounted cash flow analysis is because companies could just take the money that they'd have to spend trying something new and just put it in the bank or just buy bonds. And so money decreases in value over time. So companies, in order to be profitable, can't just make the same money that they put in. They need to make enough money that the return that they get is better than buying a bond. And so here we have two example cash flows for a project A and for a project B. And you can see that even though one might have a big payment at the end, the other has more small steady payments. And in the end, the one that has small steady payments is just slightly more attractive than the big one. But here, here's where I want to kind of add something to this classic idea. As I said at the beginning, my job is to try to predict the future. Someone says, we might want to enter into this market. Is it a good idea? I don't know. I don't know. It's impossible to know. What you can do is assign a variety of outcomes, different probabilities. And so you have a probability curve. And you can say, well, maybe there's this chance that we go, we t go into this market and there's no money. Or we do all this R&D and over on the right side, there's a very small chance it will be an extremely profitable endeavor. And so there's, a, there's an average, there's a mean, and that's our expected value. That's kind of how we can price this opportunity. But here's what I want to suggest to you. We don't have a lot of control as policymakers. Just don't be confusing. Don't be uncertain or unclear. Because when you're unclear and a company doesn't know if the law applies to them or how to interpret or predict the law, you have introduced variance into their ability to predict if it's a profitable opportunity. And if you have, so let's, let's go to this. This is the bad scenario. This is, this is what I'm most afraid of when I cook dinner. No one comes empty. Look how pretty that is. Look how much effort has been spent to prepare the dinner. And no one came. Why did no one come to this dinner? Because the variance was too big because the laws or the policies that were created made no sense. Even though private parties will do business almost everywhere, under almost any condition. They can't do business in a jurisdiction where they don't know what to do. Because maybe they'll be rich or maybe they'll bankrupt the company. So here's scenario two. This is a slightly nicer scenario. Make laws that are clear but very expensive to comply with. So this is when we're talking about a constituency is expressing that there are harms or risks, and we want to address those risks. And so the best way to address those risks is are we're going to do a task force, and we're going to create reporting requirements, and we're going to create special technological requirements, oftentimes before we've been able to fully study the impact or consequences because there has been a moral panic. This is still OK. Now. There's not that much variance to comply with regulation. It's just very expensive. And that means that rich companies will stay. Rich companies will come to your dinner party because they don't care what the law is. 
as long as it's kind of predictable because they have excess money to burn to retain monopolies. And so you could say for AI safety, it's very important to buy hula hoops for every employee at your company. Everyone needs to be dancing at lunch with a hula hoop. It's a silly requirement, but it won't introduce variance into projects. They'll understand how to comply. And then finally, this is the scenario you can have. Everyone comes to dinner and then your heart can be happy because you cooked the meal, you sent the invitations, you prepared dinner. And this outcome is, it doesn't, and I want to emphasize, it does not matter what laws or regulations you put into place. Companies will figure out how to comply. Put in the laws and regulations that you believe optimize the things that you are required to optimize, whether that's societal health and happiness or encouraging creative production. But if the laws are clear, low variance, very good. People can predict what will happen better. If the legal cost that you are asking companies to do is reasonable, then you'll have big and small companies come. Everyone will come to this dinner. So as policymakers, I think sometimes it, it depends when you wake up, what day, of the, what day of the week it is, how you might feel. Some days it might feel like you can really address the harms with regulations. And other days it might feel like society is evolving. The challenges presented are really overwhelming. The best you can do is just do your best on any given day. But I want to, I want to suggest that you, at a minimum, you can try to not be confusing. And you can try to make costs low enough that you have a big dinner party with lots of different people. So I want to, I want to end on this point, just talking about fair use in South Korea for a moment. Fair use has been harmonized with the U.S. in, in South Korea. Theoretically, that should be very good. That should incentivize lots of exchange between both both countries because, as I, because, well, if our laws are the same then, or similar enough, well, that means that the variance in outcomes should be small and cost should be low. And yet, is that the case? Is that the case? Well, you don't just get to pass policy or regulation. It's important. Are the outcomes of disputes predictable? Meaning, and this is really the critical thing when I, when, when, when I work with someone to try to price out a future opportunity. If a fight happens, what happens next? That's very different from the written text of the law. It has to do with how much does it cost to participate in this conflict resolution system? Are the rules of that system clear? And I want to leave you with this graph that I want you to consider. So at least we talked about the U.S. progress clause in our Constitution. It's about incentivizing the progress of science and the useful arts. It's about saying, okay, you said something very creative. We'll let you prevent other people from saying that thing. Then more people should say creative things. But this graph represents the commoditization of IP over time. And what we're saying here is, it does not matter if you are giving someone a limited monopoly or not. At the end of time, in 100 years, everything is open culture. Everything is free. So you don't really get to decide that a piece of an idea or an expression is copyright protectable or not, you only get to decide what you want that curve to look like. And there are different businesses. Some businesses are very good at having proprietary technology. Other businesses have a great skill in using open cultural technology. 
Which businesses do we want? Probably a mix of both. But that's something that should be considered. Who do we want to invite? To the dinner party, when can we eat? When can we eat? Should a rights holder be given an infinite monopoly over their creation? Certainly not. If they're given an infinite monopoly, that will disincentivize new creation. That will lead to societal harm. But obviously, rights holders should be given limited monopolies because if, they're not, if their works aren't protected for at least a bit of time, it does not make sense for them to participate. So what I want to suggest is it's less about saying what will happen and more about creating market conditions that are nice and clear and certain so that the different players in the marketplace can spend the least amount of money possible to figure out how they should interact with each other. So we want to send the invitations. Invite, we want to invite the people to dinner. Korea is already extremely competitive with other jurisdictions and it has harmonized IP law. The domestic market is among the most competitive in the world. It's, it's incredible the amount of AI, homegrown AI research and development and product. What's missing? What can we do to make, for both domestic and foreign companies, the outcomes of disputes more predictable? How do we set that table so people can come and have a good dinner? Thank you. 네, 법률 고문님 말씀 잘 들었습니다. Thank you very much for your presentation. You, I'm using the analogy of an invitation to a dinner party uh, and made us to think about some of the issues at stake for the future. Thank you very much once again. So thank you. That was the last presentation. Um, sorry, that's the second last presentation to topic number one. So um, creativity and arts, which were considered to be unique uh, features of human beings, are now being uh, encroached by the artificial intelligence and there's a lot of this kind of debate going on in Korea and elsewhere. So we have looked from the industry's perspective but now let's take a view from the rights holders perspective. I'm now going to invite Song Cho Huang, director of uh, the Korean Music Copyright Association. Let's welcome him to the stage with a big round of applause. Good morning. I am uh, Sancheol Huang, Director General of Licensing Bureau 2 of uh, Korea Music Copyright Association. Unfortunately, I uh, caught a cold, so my voice condition is quite bad, so please bear with me. We are experiencing a slight delay, so I was requested to uh, stay concise and swift, so I will try my best. This is the order in which my presentation will proceed, starting with the creator's reaction and uh, their view on AI. I will move on to cover how the creators are viewing TDM exemption, what op opinions they hold, which will be followed by the bills and institution required to provide ample protection to creators. And I will end on what efforts are being taken by COMCA and other uh, similar associations. So, starting with the creator's view on AI, most of our association members and other creators are very much focused on creation itself. So, they 
do not really place a lot of uh, significance on other topics. But when we sent out an invitation to this uh, seminar on uh, copyright and AI, it, all the seats were filled up in 10 minutes, less than 10 minutes. So we were quite surprised. But the roster was filled up very quickly, which is a testament to how much they are interested in AI. And while they are feeling a quite quite a threat, uh, they do not where to go to to get reliable information. This was a common feedback we heard from many creators. And Gen AI, uh, if they actually start to encroach on uh, the music creative industry, uh, they are fearing that they might uh, lose their uh, current positions in the industry. So we held this seminar in July, and we also held the CSAC General Assembly in Mexico in June. And the famous composer from ABBA is sitting in the middle, and a princess uh, from Africa is sitting on the left, and she is a significant figure in the pop music in Africa. And many other participants explain their views on Gen AI. And almost all of the sessions dealt with AI. And we heard a lot of opinions uh, from creators. But a common thread is the fear that they will be replaced by AI. And their confusion on how to respond to such changes and their need to take action to um, be prepared for such times. But this goes beyond the music industry to the video uh, industry also, as our previous presenter uh, explained, there was a big strike in Hollywood, which shows the impact of AI. And EVA is an association of visual artists. They published this statement showing how uh, gravely they are taking this issue. So the European visual artists are uh, requesting to the EC to uh, come up with measures to protect creators. So all of the creative sectors are uh, starting to voice out their look on the issue of AI and the impact on creative industry. According to statistical data in 2025, humanity will create about 181 zettabytes per year. That might sound like an unfamiliar unit, but if we can put that into perspective, it means 5.7 billion megabyte is of data is created in second. And this is bigger than all of the music that has been created uh, so far. It is bigger than the entire amount of music that is being distributed nowadays. And AI contributes to such spike in data creation. AI creates a huge amount of data within such a short span of time. So are human beings really able to uh, stand up against AI and uh, have a chance of outperforming them? AI can create more music than human uh, beings ever created throughout human history. And also, we are already seeing how AI is encroaching upon the music industry. If you look at the headlines of some news articles, Naver, CJ, ENM, and TV shopping channels, and even conglomerates such as Samsung are turning to AI uh, when they need music or sound source. But we have already seen such an effect when it comes to BGM. But if it spreads to other uh, genres of music, then no music market or branch is safe from the impact of AI or encroachment of AI. Against such backdrop, many bills are proposed uh, and are held at the National Assembly uh, proposing for an introduction of TTM. AI is a huge competitor for human uh, creators. But if this exemption is 
passed into law, then creators will have to almost donate their work to train their competitors, namely AIs. Uh, and this is causing a lot of fear uh, in the creative industry. Many of the bills are along the same lines with slight minor detail differences. There is a separate session in the afternoon uh, that delves deeper into such bills, so I will now skip this part. But I just want to emphasize uh, that we must uh, review if the bills provide ample protection for creators. There, there is no opt-out, uh, as in the case of Europe, when we look at bills proposed in Korea. And it says that only cases where the relevant work can be lawfully accessed are applicable, uh, which serves as some sort of protection for creators. But in a practical sense, I highly doubt that. Lawful access uh, should be clearly defined, but I think lawful access is different from lawful use. This statement here only requires lawful access but does not require lawful use. In that case, if a, a database itself was unlawfully created, they can still be lawfully accessed by the AI companies and can be freely used for training AI. So the bill obviously has a loophole when it comes to creation, uh, protection of creators. I'm sure some people have different views on this issue. From uh, the Office of Assemblyman Yong Ho Lee, it says that the intention is to limit the use of data analysis outcomes to certain purposes unless a separate license has been obtained while enabling free use under a license for the protected work in order to secure room for data-related businesses and protect the rights of right holders. So. It sounds like they are going to limit the application to uh, only cases where there is a separate license. But if you look deeper into it, it only requires for lawful access. So this does not necessarily translate into lawful use of the work. Another concern on TDM exemption is the presence of fair use provision in Korean copyright law. We are not uh, blindly opposed to the fair use or TDM exemption. But we should first take stock of the cases where fair use is applied and if there are remaining cases that require another exemption provision, then we can consider introduction of TDM exemption. And this could sometimes lead to an exaggerated limitation on the copyright holders and that could be compensated with other amendments. And my bottom line, which is shared by many other creators, is there is no need for another exemption at this point since we already have the fair use provision. Well, when it comes to Japan, they only have the TDM exemption and not a fair use. And if you look at the UK or Canada that has the fair dealing provision, they do not uh, have a TDM exemption. Uh, the UK has a TDM exemption, but it is only limited to non-commercial research. So the range is much narrower than uh, the TDM exemption that is proposed in the Korean bills, which has a much wider range of applications. And Singapore or Ireland, which are smaller countries, sometimes do have both of the exemptions. But in the case of Singapore, although the size of the country is small, it is still home to a large number of big tech companies. The same goes for Ireland. And as uh, General Counsel Maxwell Sills uh, said, it could, there could be a choice. To com if we need to invite the tech companies to the dinner to convince them, then perhaps we do need this uh, provision. But in Korea, we have a greatly growing cultural sector like musicians such as BTS, the same goes for the movie industry and webtoon industry. A lot of the K content is really uh, taking the world by storm, creating a K wave. But do we ne really need to take the lead and uh, push forward with the TDM exemption, which may have a hampering effect on the cultural sector? Uh, this is a point that should be considered. And what other bills 
do the cultural sector actually need other than TDM exemption? The issue of moral rights was uh, emphasized by Professor Rajan and I would like to echo her. If we look at this bill that is proposed in Europe, it requires a disclosure of the summary information on the training data that was used. And I think Korea is in need of such a provision also. AI is definitely being trained on copyrighted musical works, but the right holders cannot track all of such use. If you look at the output or the search engine AIs, if we look at the outputs that were delivered by them, we can sometimes use what information was used to train the data. But when it comes to composition works, just by looking at the AI output is not enough to infer back to what work was used for its training. So right holders needs to have more clarity on the training data that is used for the AI model. And without such clarity, if no research institute probably has researched sufficiently into the economic impact of the TDM exemption, if more clarity is delivered, then we will be able to predict the social cost. So such research should first take place before we uh, pass any of these bills on TDM exemption into law. And the next topic is about the attribution or the credit on AI a generated output. A bill is at the National Assembly currently, but the registration of AI comp composer EVOM was an issue that our association had to struggle with. At first, it was registered on our association uh, when we did not know that it was an AI output. We later found out, so we took uh, ex post measures saying that the registration uh, cannot be uh, maintained as valid. And this was heavily covered in the media. So if AI uh, work is a part of a work, AI work is not copyrightable, so no royalty or compensation could be collected for such work. But if we just look at the data of the works that are registered on our registry, we cannot distinguish which one of those is AI work or not. So attribution is required to avoid uh, such uh, issues with regards to wrongful uh, collection of royalty or compensation. Last but not least, this is an issue that should be further reviewed. Then how can royalty or compensation be paid for the data that was used for AI training. We don't have a clear uh, direction or opinion on this. Uh, there is a lot of different suggestions. Sh should we go with royalties or pay compensation? There's no real consensus. But what creators see as a gap is when it comes to US and EU, they hold many uh, listening sessions or public hearing sessions to gather the voices of the creators, but there is no active uh, discourse uh, that is being conducted in Korea. There is also, of course, the working group, but us as an association did not have many opportunities to really voice our thoughts. So I would like to urge uh, there to be more such venues to be created. And an interesting law was proposed in France. It is a very early stage bill, so there is no guarantee that this will be enacted in the future. But as a creator, I am very uh, delighted and happy that such conversation is taking place. So I would like to introduce this to you today. Work created by purely by AI, when it comes to such work, the creator will be 
uh, deemed as the owner. So the AI company is not going to be the owner, but when it comes to the AI generated work, the authors of the data that was used for training will uh, be attributed ownership. When services are made or sold, uh, much profits can be earned for the AI companies. So if creators can be compensated in this way, then I think this is a way to uh, respect and protect the rights of the creators. And the CMOs should be in charge of managing such purely AI-generated work, according to the bill. There needs to be further discussion on the uh, right level of uh, royalty or compensation, but for associations, we only need to uh, deal with the CMOs, uh, which will facilitate use of such pure AI-generated works. And of course, it includes a provision requiring attribution or notice that it is an AI work. And a creative development tax for CMOs was introduced in this uh, French bill uh, in cases that lack clear information on the author of the original work. So these were some foreign cases that could uh, shed us some light on what bills Korea also needs in the future. And I will not like to uh, move to the last part of my uh, chapter on the efforts of our association, CONCA. We have been deliberating on these issues for five years, I think, but we didn't expect the pace of change to be this past. However, there was a dramatic rise of such technology with the advent of ChatGPT really spiking the national attention on this issue. So we now inserted this provision for licenses. So within the scope of license, we try to clarify the range of legitimate use. So we do not agree to use the work as a training data for AI, and such cases require a separate license. That is the gist of our contract provision. And this could be a slightly different take on the issue, but the SNE, uh, which is a syndicate in France, has a similar provision. It says that there are many limitations of the work for such AI purposes. I, I'm sure you have all this information in your booklet, and we are running out of time, so I will just briefly cover them. And a similar provision is also found in the US Authors Guild provision. They also have a model contract. The US Authors Guild here is a different uh, organization than the WGA that was introduced in the previous presentation. So mainly the US Authors Guild have a membership of literary figures who have who may include Nobel laureates for their literature work. Uh, so the Authors Guild have this model contract that they share with the members so uh, they can make contracts with the platform providers. So such efforts are being made uh, by these creative uh, associations and looking out into the future, especially when it comes to the TDM exemption, many of such provisions are being introduced in Europe or other countries, but this could also impact uh, Korea's copyright works. So if you look at the European bills with the opt-out provision, we are thinking, really deliberating on how to make notice for AI works and how can CMOs handle uh, this issue as being explored uh, at meetings held with uh, CMOs. As for Korea, 
creators are largely collaborating with uh, creators from Northern Europe. Uh, so the bills or the perhaps EU directives uh, could potentially impact the works uh, that involve Korean creators. So we are uh, looking heavily at this issue, the legal trends of other countries. And as I've already mentioned, creators have this sense of fear and they do not where to go to to get reliable information. So I would like to urge on their behalf, including not only uh, musical creators, but many other creators, I really urge you to reach out to us if you need our input, then I hope we will be able to explore for, uh, further ways of collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. You elaborated on how creators view AI and what measures, bills, or framework might be necessary to protect uh, the creators. The French case was interesting because the contribution ratio uh, could be uh, very unclear, but you introduced us to the idea of creative development tax. So we heard both from the right holders and from the industries about uh, the Gen AI and copyright issues. So thank you, all speakers, and thank you, all uh, participants, for staying with us for the first session. Uh, topic number two is about generative AI, legal challenges, and recommendations. And we have six speakers on the, this topic. So copyright protection and industry development have to strike a balance, and many countries are exerting policy efforts to strike that balance. And so first of all, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Andrew Foglia, Deputy Director of the Office of Policy and International Affairs at the USCO. Let's welcome him to the stage with a big round of applause. Can you hear? Okay, excellent. So good afternoon. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here at the Seoul Copyright Forum. This is my second time in Seoul. Uh, my previous visit was almost a decade ago. I tried recreating part of that visit yesterday morning by running to Namsan Tower. And if I seem tired, it is not just the jet lag, it is because I'm still recovering from my foolishness. Before I begin, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me in here and for extending such a warm welcome to Korea. And I want to thank the other presenters for sharing their insights. It is exciting to be here with so many experts from around the world grappling with these same urgent issues. How can we configure a copyright system to continue to serve human creativity in the age of artificial intelligence? Today, I'm going to talk about the US Copyright Office's experience with generative AI, how the topic presents itself to us, how we are responding to the legal issues it raises, and how we are formulating policy recommendations to the United States Congress. I will also, if there is time, briefly dis uh, discuss some of the other actors in the US government, at the White House and in the courts, who are influencing our, cop our copyright policy around AI as well. So first, I'd like to explain how the US Copyright Office fits into the US government's policymaking apparatus. We are part of the legislative branch, and we sit within the Library of Congress. We advise Congress on copyright policy. We also work with other agencies to, come, uh, to work on international matters or legal cases involving copyright. Importantly for AI, we administer the country's registration system. Each year, we issue about a half million copyright to registration claims, covering millions of different works. It is this responsibility for registration that has put us at the forefront of the US government's uh, policy making on generative AI. So, as I'm sure you all know, for a long time, AI was a theoretical problem in copyright. As far back as 1965, in an annual report to Congress, the US Copyright Office opined on the possibility of copyright protection for computer-generated works. The report stated, quote, the crucial question appears to be whether the work is basically one of human authorship, with the computer merely being an assisting instrument, or whether the traditional elements of authorship in the work, 
literary, artistic, or musical expression, or elements of selection, arrangements, etc., were actually conceived and executed not by a man, but by a machine. As I said, for decades this was a theoretical problem. The last few years have changed that. And for the United States, that change struck first in our registration system. In February of 2022, an applicant sought to register this image, a recent entrance to paradise. I'm grateful for our keynote speaker explaining this so well, because it makes my job much easier. Now, whatever the artistic merits of this image, opinions do seem to differ, it's clear that if a human had painted this, copyright would protect it. But the applicant, Stephen Thaler, identified the author as the creativity machine. He described the work as, quote, autonomously created by a computer algorithm running on a machine. This was a test case. Thaler, who has filed similar applications around the world and analogous cases in the patent system, was trying to push the boundaries of copyright law. In reviewing the application, our office was not working from a blank slate. Again, the keynote speaker covered this very well earlier. Uh, although this may have been our first application explicitly seeking to register a work to an AI author, we had over a century of precedent regarding non-human authorship. In a sense, the policy judgment was already made for us. The US Constitution authorizes copyright protection for authors and authorship, uh, sorry, and copyright law in the US protects, quote, works of authorship. Although these terms, authors and authorship, don't have official definitions in the text, US courts have interpreted them to require copyrighted works to have a human author. I'll briefly describe one of these cases. So in a 19th century case called Burrow Giles Lithographic Co. v. Sereny, the US Supreme Court examined whether a photograph could have copyright protection. The photo at issue was this well-known portrait of Oscar Wilde. One side argued that the photograph was a, quote, mere mechanical reproduction created through the click of a camera's shutter and therefore could not be protected by copyright. The Supreme Court disagreed. It held that the photo reflected creative choices by the photographer, posing wild in a particular way, selecting and arranging the costumes and the draperies, choosing the lighting. And these human creative choices qualified the photograph as a work of authorship. More recent cases have affirmed that this authorship in US copyright law means human authorship. So Professor Amir covered this as well, but you may be familiar with the monkey selfie case, where a US Court of Appeals said that a monkey cannot register a copyright. One of the reasons was that the Copyright Act refers to authors in human terms. In another case, a court held that there was no copyright protection for a book allegedly dictated by divine spirits. It said that the book could qualify for copyright protection only if there were, quote, human selection and arrangement of the divine revelations, end quote. So the Copyright Office has long observed this human copyright uh, requirement in our practice manual, which states that, quote, to qualify as a work of authorship, a work must be created by a human being. The office will not register works produced by a machine or mere mechanical process that operates randomly or automatically without any creative input or intervention from a human author. So, back to Dr. Thaler and a recent entrance to paradise. Thaler said that the work was autonomously created by a computer algorithm running on a machine. Therefore, the US Copyright Office refused to register the work because it lacked human authorship. Fowler sued us. He argued that the text of the Copyright does not Act does not explicitly restrict copyright to human-made works. Further, he said that any ambiguity should be resolved in favor of protection in order to encourage the maximum creation and dissemination of new works. As an aside on the policy arguments, uh, it doesn't appear to me that the absence of, protec of protection has caused any dearth of investment in or use of AI. On the other hand, I have seen some argue that at some future point, when AI generated, when AI generated works are more widely competing with human generated works, leaving the former free to copy and distribute might harm the latter. One commenter I saw drew an analogy to early US copyright policy. For most of the 19th century, the United States did not actually protect foreign works. 
And while in one sense that might see, have seemed like an unfair protection for U.S. authors, in fact, U.S. authors found that they were struggling to sell their works to consumers who were satisfied with free, i.e. pirated, copies of foreign works. So the danger, according to this commenter, is that free AI works would eventually outcompete human works that you have to pay for. I mention these policy arguments because our office is interested in assessing them as part of a broader study of AI, which I'll discuss later. But for present purposes, as our office reads the Copyright Act and the case law, the requirement for human authorship is clear. Happily, the court agreed with us. Uh, in August, the US District Court for the District of Columbia issued a decision affirming that the human authorship is an essential part of a valid copyright uh, claim. Fowler has appealed, and so there may be more to say about this in a few months. Now, the Fowler application was in some ways an easy one because Thaler maintained that the work was created entirely by AI. What about works produced through a combination of human and machine? What type of human contribution is enough to merit copyright protection? Again, I thank our keynote speaker for covering this and making my job easier. So not long after we refused the Thaler application, we received an application for this work, uh, a comic book titled Zarya of the Dawn. The applicant, Chris Castanova, wrote the text of the comic book. The images were generated using the AI system Midjourney. You can see the cover and other images here. Now, the application did not initially disclose the role of AI, so the office initially registered the work to Castanova. We later learned that the applicant had taken to social media to claim that they had successfully registered their AI work. Uh, so we requested more information from the applicant and conducted further review. We ultimately determined that because of the way that Kashinova had used Midjourney in this instance, the, image of the images in the comic book lacked sufficient human authorship to be protected by copyright. So we canceled the original registration and we issued a more limited one. The new registration covered, sorry, the work that Kashinova herself authored, that is the text, and then also the selection, coordination, and arrangement of the text and images. We also noted that modifications to an AI-generated image could themselves be entitled to copyright protection. This decision reflected our bedrock human authorship requirement. When AI is involved in the creative process, the level of human, involve of human involvement is crucial for determining the scope of copyrightability. Components of a work that are original to an author, a human author, are eligible for copyright protection. So after a recent entrance to paradise and Azaria of the Dawn, we started receiving many more requests for guidance on how to register works created using artificial intelligence. To address these, the, the issues that these two applications raised, on March 16th of this year, we issued new registration guidance for works containing material generated by AI. This guidance did two things. First, it reaffirmed the human authorship requirement and explained the constitutional and statutory basis for it. And second, it instructed applicants that if their work, if their work includes AI-generated content that is more than de minimis, then they have a duty to disclose the AI content and they must provide a brief explanation of the human author's contribution. So what does that mean? Well, it means the question to ask is, would the AI material standing on its own be copyrightable if it were human authored? If so, then a very brief statement disclosing that the work was AI generated should be included in the application. So to give an example, individual words and, short, and titles are not protectable under US copyright law ordinarily. If I wrote only a few words of a poem, I probably would not be able to get a copyright on those words. And if an AI wrote them, I would not need to disclose it. By contrast, a larger passage might be copyrightable, and if an AI wrote it, that would need to be disclosed. This is similar to our long-standing rules for new works that include public domain or third-party copyrighted material. You have to disclaim the public domain material or the third-party material. So our goal here is not to set up barriers to registration. We're not the copyright police. We're not actually even the, the agents in the US that enforces copyright. We want to help applicants obtain their registrations that will not face validity challenges down the line. After we published the guidance, we had many questions from creators and lawyers about how the guidance would apply in concrete cases. So this summer, 
as part of an AI initiative, I'll explain a little more later, the office hosted a webinar to walk through the guidance, to provide concrete examples, and to answer some frequently asked questions. I'll share one scenario that came up. So in some cases, a human artist will create a work, and then they will apply AI on top of it. In those scenarios, what we say is, you could simply register the earlier version of the work from before the AI-generated material, material was incorporated. For example, if you write a book in Spanish and then used AI to translate it into English, you could re register your Spanish language book that you wrote, and then if somebody were to translate that book into, or sorry, if somebody were to infringe the English language translation, they would necessarily be infringing your Spanish language copyright. So you would be protected. Now, we realize that our guidance would not resolve all of the questions around the use of AI in the creation process. We would need to continue addressing applications on a case-by-case -case basis. And new cases could call for us to issue new guidance. That's actually a good thing. This process gives us an opportunity to continue refining our own thinking. Just last month, our internal review board issued another decision in a complex registration claim involving AI. The image at issue is the one you see on the right here, uh, Teatro del Prospecial. Even before it reached our doors, this one was actually in the national news. It was a minor, minor news story in the US when it won a fine art competition. The applicant, Jason Allen, created the image using Midjourney. The image on the left is what Midjourney generated, and the image on the right is the completed work that Mr. Allen sought to register. When the claim was originally submitted to us, there was no mention about the work being uh, based on Midjourney. But because the involvement of AI had been national news, our examiner knew to request additional information. In response, Mr. Allen, Mr. Allen stated that he, quote, input numerous revisions and text prompts at least 624 times to arrive at the initial version of the image. He also explained that he used Adobe Photoshop and, uh, to remove flaws and create some new visual content in the image. And he used Gigapixel AI to upscale the image, increasing its resolution and size. But Mr. Allison, or sorry, Mr. Allen declined the examiner's request to disclaim the AI-generated aspects, and he reasserted his claim to the entire work. We concluded that the work could not be registered unless the claim was limited to the authorship that Mr. Allen himself contributed. Consistent with our registration guidance, we accepted that human-authored visual edits made with Adobe Photoshop were de minimis and did not need to be disclaimed. But the more extensive features generated using Midjourney and Gigapixel AI did need to be excluded as non-human authorship. The applicant ultimately brought the case to our internal review board. The board affirmed that Mr. Allen could not be considered the author of the initial image since his sole contribution was inputting the text prompts. Because this was AI generated, sorry, because this AI generated material was more than a de minimis contribution, the whole, like, it needed to be disclaimed. In the board's view, even though Mr. Allen described entering over 600 uh, text prompts before landing on the mid-journey image, the resulting image ultimately depended on interpretive choices made within the black box of, mid of the mid-journey system. I'm actually going to pause briefly on that black box metaphor. The idea is that authorial decisions are happening inside the model, opaque to the user and sometimes actually to the AI developer itself. They're happening there rather than in the human prompter's mind. So we've said about Zarya of the Dawn and in our registration guidance that the specifics of the technology matter. With Dolly 3, for example, our understanding is that the, the system will actually invisibly rewrite the user's prompts sometimes to engineer a better output. The fact that a human might not even be responsible for the operative prompts in those cases casts more doubt that repeated prompting using the system should give rise to a claim of authorship. All right, so, so far I've been describing our history with, copyright, with the copyrightability question because registration has been the most immediate challenge for our office. But of course, copyrightability is only one of the many issues involving with AI. There is also widespread public uh, debate about the use of copyrighted works to train AI models and the use of those models to imitate humans' voices and likenesses and their style of living artists, artists, among other issues. 
So in response to growing congressional and public interest, in March of this year, the U.S. Copyright Office launched a comprehensive AI initiative. You can think of the initiative as comprising three main components. First, the registration guidance, which I described earlier. Second, engagement with stakeholders, including public listening sessions. And third, a noticing inquiry to solicit written public comments on a wide range of pol policy questions. I'll turn now to the second of those two components. Our engagement with stakeholders over the past year has taken a few different forms. First, in April and May, we held four public listening sessions on AI. Each session focused on a different category of creative work. The first was on literary works, including print journalism and software. The second on works of visual art. The third on audiovisual works, including video games. And the fourth on music and sound recordings. These listening sessions were each two hours, fully virtual, to help accommodate a broad audience uh, and broad participation from people around the world. Over the four listening sessions, we had nearly 90 participants, representing individual artists, academic experts, legal practitioners, technology companies, and industry associations. We were pleased we were able to bring many people and organizations who do not ordinarily participate in our policymaking process. After the listening sessions, we hosted two public webinars. The first, which I mentioned earlier, was focused on registration of works containing AI-generated material. The second webinar turned to international developments and generative AI and copyright law. Each webinar attracted uh, roughly 2,000 viewers. In addition to the listening sessions and webinars, throughout the year we spoke with a broad spectrum of stakeholders. By my, my, sorry, by my count, we spoke to are held at least 40 different meetings with academics, trade groups, and individual creators, technology companies, uh, and creative industries. Those meetings provided valuable information to us on the technical aspects of generative AI models. They also taught us more about how creators, or creators are using generative AI or responding to it. And they revealed continuing questions about, uh, that copyright applicants have about how to register works containing AI-generated material. All of this engagement with stakeholders went to informing the next phase of our initiative. As I said at the outset, part of our responsibility at the U.S. Copyright Office is to advise Congress on copyright policy. To that end, in August, we published a notice of inquiry soliciting public comment on a range of questions related to generative AI. The purpose is to collect factual information and views so that we can better analyze the current state of the law, identify unresolved issues, and evaluate potential areas for legislative or regulatory action. Our notice of inquiry uh, posed 34 questions with many more subparts. You can roughly group them into four uh, major topics, although the ones I describe here may not be quite how we worded them in the study. First, there is the use of copyrighted works to uh, train AI models. Under this heading, we ask factual questions about training practices, as well as legal questions about fair use, licensing, and data transparency. For example, does employing uh, copyrighted materials to train generative AI constitute infringement? Uh, if so, under what circumstances? If consent and or compensation is required, uh, how can this feasibly be accomplished? Uh, given, the work, the, given the volume of works involved. And if the public desires an ability to opt out of having their materials trained on, how can that be achieved? The second category of questions concerns the copyrightability of material generated using AI systems. I spoke at length earlier about the human authorship requirements in US law. Our notice, for comment, uh, sorry, our notice asks for comments on how the Copyright Office has applied the human authorship requirement and it also asks whether a different policy might be desirable. Now, I should clarify that this is not actually a proposal to change the policy on our part. Um, the policy has constitutional roots, as a keynote speaker uh, noted. It's merely an attempt to gather information on the public's views. The third category of questions has to do with potential liability for infringing outputs of AI systems. For example, how can copyright owners prove the element of copying if the developer of the AI model has not made available all the works in the training set or the information of what is in the training set? 
our existing civil discovery rule sufficient to address the situation? In the US, plaintiffs would not ordinarily get to take that discovery of, mater of training materials until they'd already alleged that their own material was in the training set. This has been a challenge for some litigants in the US. Separately, if the output of a system is found to infringe a copyrighted work, who should be directly or secondarily liable? The developer of the AI model? The developer of the AI system using the model? The distributor of the system? The end users? To the extent that AI companies risk secondary liability for their users' acts, should there be a way for them to earn safe harbor? Finally, we ask about AI outputs that imitate the identity or style of human artists. This is related to the moral rights issues that Professor Romero was mentioning earlier. In the United States, protections against certain uses of a person's identity or vocal likeness are a matter of state law, a state tort law. It's not federal law and it's not copyright law actually at all. But in the age of generative AI, performing artists in particular have raised concerns about AI generated uh, works imitating their likenesses, their voices, or their styles. So our notice asks some questions about the adequacy of existing state laws and the desirability of a new federal law. So it's a lot of questions, uh, and that actually took some editing. Earlier drafts ran to nearly 100 questions, so getting it down to 30 foreign changes feels okay, actually. <laughs> now, before I close, I spent most of my time on what the US Copyright Office is doing, but other parts of the US government are active on AI as well. In the legislative branch, oh, sorry. In the legislative branch, Congress has held hearings related to copyright and AI. The Senate Majority Leader is holding insight forums with business leaders and tech uh, leaders. In addition, some senators recently introduced a bill that to protect individual, uh, individuals' voices and likenesses from unauthorized recreations using generative AI. In the executive branch, the Federal Trade Commission held a hearing on generative AI earlier this month. The US Patent and Trademark Office has an ongoing series of partnership events on AI and emerging, emerging technologies, as well as a request for comments on AI and inventorship. The relatively new National Artificial Intelligence uh, Advisory Committee advises the president on topics related to AI, occasionally touching on copyright. The White House has a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. And in the judiciary, there are currently many pending, ca uh, pending cases involving AI. In addition to Stephen Thaler suing us, uh, there are a number of artists suing AI companies over using their works and training data. These cases are very early so far. None has yet reached a decision on the core question of whether the use of copyrighted works to train AI is fair use. So what's next? Uh, the deadline for initial comments on our notice of inquiry is October 30th. Uh, and then there's a reply comment period that will end November 29th. As of this morning, we've received 9,000 comments. We, we will be reviewing all of those comments uh, with human eyes, as well as monitoring developments in the courts and in the marketplace. We hope to produce one or more reports, uh, and these reports will contain analyses of the uh, state of current law and possibly recommendations for changes in law or regulations. We'll, we will also continue to look for opportunities to update our registration guidance. We are in regular contact with other parts of the US government as we examine these issues. And finally, we are talking to copyright policymakers in other countries about their approaches. That's one of the reasons this has been such a delight to be here and learn from others. Our notice asks whether there are approaches in other countries that the US should adopt. Um, and these are early days, we know, and it remains to be seen how some of these laws will be interpreted. Um, further conversations, we hope, will improve the chances of reaching a greater international consensus on these issues. I'll close by saying that we are very much looking forward to reading the comments on our notice. Uh, we hope to find a way forward that ensures that human creativity can continue to thrive and that also promotes rather than inhibits the development of this exciting technology. In the months and the years ahead, we want to determine what AI policies are best for the human beneficiaries, both authors and users, of our copyright system. Thank you. 네, 좋은 발표 잘 들었습니다.
AI, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you have given us a variety of case studies of uh, works where AI had intervened, and you also talked about the policy making process as well as the notice of inquiry and the consultations that you have performed. So um, we look forward to further updates from the Copyright Office. So we have heard from the United States, and now we're going to go back to Korea. And we would like to now invite uh, Sun Gyun K, Professor of the Pusan National University School of Law. Let's welcome Professor K with a big round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. I will introduce the policy efforts of Korea. I am sure our uh, Korean participants will be well aware of my presentation, but since these are important messages, please just serve this opportunity to remind you of yourselves. I will start by introducing the Copyright Act of Korea and give you an overview of the AI uh, sector and startups in Korea. And also, I will touch upon the bills that are currently at the National Assembly and some administrative efforts and the view of the right holders and uh, some of my personal opinions on this matter. So to start off, the Copyright Act of Korea has similarities with other countries in that it uh, presumes creators to be human beings. So it imposes value on the creative activities of human beings, referring to natural humans and it grants rights on creative actions as with the European countries and the US Korea follows the small coin theory in that no matter how small the contribution of creation was it still is deemed as creation but the problem is that AI creations are now outdoing cre human creations. If their creations were subpar, uh, then it would not have been uh, viewed as such a critical issue. But AI outputs are now superior uh, to human creations in some sense. So that is why it is being hotly by the topic. The Copyright Act of Korea was enacted in 1957. and. In 1986, the act was wholly amended. At that time, there were some trade conflicts with the US, which led to an amendment of the current Copyright Act. So if we take that as our reference, the creator is the right holder, who is also the accountable or responsible party. This formula or this principle was upheld until now. And through 15 uh, amendments, the act stimulated growth of the cultural sector and to keep pace with the trends of the times. So the right of the creator and the interest of the cultural consumers were well balanced through the efforts from the legal uh, perspective. However, the emergence of AI is introducing an unknown uh, agent of creation to the picture. So it leads to uh, many issues that are not prescribed by the current copyright regime. Since the 18th century, copyright regime has been protecting the spiritual and cultural value 
uh, and the creations. So this has to be revisited. And also, uh, the issues are pushing us to take stock of the economic significance of copyright. So I will now introduce what efforts have been made in Korea to uh, uh, to handle the emergence of AI. As senior researcher Han Yu Ko have introduced in his introduction on the efforts of the LG AI lab, I will make my this part brief. In 2018, well, there were 26 AI companies in Korea, but as of 2023, there are 309 companies who are dedicated to uh, the AI business, and there is even an AI association in Korea with a membership of AI-related companies. And there is an AI index, and Korea ranks sixth on the list. But if we look at the investment amount, uh, it is still overshadowed by the investments uh, in the US or other countries. If we look at Gen AI startups in Korea, you can see some names on the slide that deals with not only text but also videos. So various startups are entering uh, the sector. And now I will look at some legislative efforts. In 2016, uh, AlphaGo brought a great impact and really made us aware of the significance of AI. So our relevant ministries and government agencies have uh, been engaging in a lot of efforts. So from 2023 to 2023, a bill was introduced almost every year. First, this bill was introduced in 2020 by Assemblyman Ho Young Chu. It was not passed. It was a bill that was proposed, but it was a bit too progressive for that time. AI works and the author of AI generated works must be defined and the author of AI-generated works should be decided according to the presidential decree, considering the extent of creative contribution, and the term of the IP rights should be five years since publication, and all AI outputs should be registered and carry notice that it was generated by AI. So these were uh, stipulated in the bill, but they were a bit too rushed uh, for the time. And Assemblyman Chowan Do introduced a bill in 2021. And it was basically an amendment for a whole amendment of the Copyright Act but I only took out provisions relevant to AI. This bill uh, proposes a new exemption for use of works for data mining due to the rise of big data. All large amounts of data that includes protected works may be used and without permission in many cases. So. In order to determine whether it is a copyright infringement, according to Article thir 35, we have the fair use provision, but we must deliver it if the fair use provision is applicable to such cases. And if so, the interpretations may be different depending on the specifics of the circumstances. So the fair use exemption is not enough to clarify the legality of such use and that is why we need additional exemption and 
it will be necessary to give relevant industries more predictability. Therefore, in cases of lawful access, the works should be covered under TDM exemption so that a balance could be achieved between the industry's uh, interests and the right holders' interests. And in 2022, another bill was sponsored by Assemblyman Yong Ho Lee, and the content is largely similar to the a bill introduced by Assemblyman Do. And uh, Director Huang already covered uh, this in his presentation, so I will make it short. And this year, in June, Assemblyman Huang, Huang Bo uh, sponsored a bill. So it is a bit different than other bills in saying that there is the need to clarify the scope of permitted use. Uh, but it is largely along the same lines as the previous two bills that I have introduced. Moving on to the efforts and cultural administration, largely spearheaded by the KCC, the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism tried to keep pace with the times by exploring the copyright issues that are newly emerging. In 2018, a copyright future strategy consultative body was established in the MCST to focus on the copyright regime issues. And I took part in this effort. And in 2019, the copyright future strategy consultative body re resolved the value gap issue. And in 2020, the ministry proposed an entire revision of the Copyright Act and proposed to introduce the TDM exemption. In 2023, which is this year, the Copyright uh, Legislative Framework Working Group has been established, uh, which will be introduced in a later presentation today. So it deliberates on whether using human authors' work to train AI is justifiable, and whether the text and image output of AI must be protected under the copyright regime as works of human beings. And if so, whom, to whom will the rights be attributed? And we are, there have been research con conducted on different phases uh, with regards to Gen AI, such as the synthesis phase and the use phase. And now to move on to the voices of the industry members, we've heard uh, from Director Huang about the perspective of Korea Music Copyright Association. And the association formed an AI response task force in May this year. And he pointed to the destruction of the creative ecosystem. He mentioned how for uh, advertisement music, AI is now largely uh, depended on to create such music. And Komka urged us to go back to the original values of copyright, which is a regime to protect the rights of the creators. And the Internet Newspaper Association and Korea Online Newspaper Association and Korean Association of Newspapers urges to respect the rights of new, the right holders of news content, which are media outlets. And they oppose applying the exemption uh, to news content mining. Also, they are demanding appropriate compensation for the use of news content in AI training and also calls for attribution and demands that uh, the media outlets be consulted with uh, when such changes are to take place. So basically, all of the major players in the media and journalism sector have joined this effort. 
and the websites of media outlets, including SBS, have uh, notifications uh, emphasizing and highlighting that they are opposed to using news content for AI training. So with the advent of artificial intelligence, the impact on creative ecosystem is being closely monitored and the emergence of ChatGPT is uh, feeling like a huge threat to the creators. Tw from 2018 and onwards, AI-related copyright issues have been closely followed, so the legislative sector and many of the copyright-related associations and agencies are making efforts to resolve those issues. We are very uh, cautious about introducing the TDM exemption because unlike many other countries, Korea has a comprehensively applied fair use exemption. And this could feel like a threat uh, for the right holders. So on top of the fair use provision, if we also introduce the TDM exemption, then it feels like just free use of the works by AI is going to be permitted. So the UK, EU, and the US uh, legislative trends are being heavily researched in Korea. And we are trying to look at the intentions behind the legislations. And a lot of research has uh, taken place. I think Korea's AI industry is, is still in the nascent phase. Government is heavily supporting the industry to keep pace with the global trends. However, compared to EU or China or the US, Korea's AI industry still has a long way to go and is yet under invested. And the right holders are a bit opposed to TDM exemption because the compensation scheme for right holders are not perfectly uh, fully formed yet. So the compensation or infringement is still uh, an area that could be further complemented. So this is partially why there's reluctance to the TDM exemption introduction. But Korea is still uh, deliberating on the provisions introduction given the trends of the time of the AI era. But Korea's government still needs to decide on a clear um, orientation or uh, path forward. The advent, advent of Gen AI opens up risks for a widespread infringement of copyright. So still a social consensus remains elusive and people are uh, still very wary about this issue. Personally, I think that a paradigm shift is coming not only in the copyright sense, but personal information and basic rights and all other aspects of the framework. So although we should not be hasty, looking at the copyright perspective, we will have to resolve any legal cloud and seek more clarity, which will assuage many concerns of right holders, but also make sure the copyright regime does not hold back the development of AI. So we need to provide 
a certain extent of legal stability. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. 네, 교수님 좋은 말씀 부탁드립니다. Thank you, Professor K, for your presentation. You talked about the efforts to protect copyright and uh, foster industrial growth and to strike a balance of the two in Korea. So thank you, and now let's move on to the third presentation from Professor Alina Dropova uh, from University College London. Let's welcome uh, Professor Dropova to the stage. Professor Alina Trafova from University College London. 네, 여러분 큰 박수로 교수님을 환영해 주시기 바랍니다. 멀리서 오셨습니다. She traveled long distances, so please welcome her with a big hand. Thank you. This is it. Okay. Perfect. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, I'm very, very happy to be here. It's my first time in Seoul, it's my first time here, and it's a great honor. So I cannot thank enough uh, the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism and the, copyright, uh, the Korean Copyright Commission for the very kind invitation. And I am an academic, so I will use my, all of my academic freedom to say everything that I want to say, and that some of you might be thinking a little bit deeper inside, but probably have certain restrictions. And I also realize that it's me, and uh, then you, we have a coffee break. So I'll try to keep this as, as engaging as possible. Um, there are several things that resonated with me when I was listening to the talks earlier today. And uh, more research is needed in this direction. This is something that cannot be underlined enough. But the impact on the market and the impact on the society of these systems has to be studied. We cannot pass legislations, we cannot extend copyright laws if we don't know what is actually the impact of this on us as a society. And we need to adopt a balanced approach. This is the other caveat I would like to start with. Um, I have written and advocated of a balanced approach more in the context of the European Union and European Union legislation, and now more in the context of a UK um, legislation on copyright. But I agree with Max, uncertainty is bad. Uncertainty is not good for business. But preemptive legislation, excessive overarching preemptive legislation with very, very strong intellectual property rights many layers of them overlapping is equally bad. So it's not always the best way forward, and we had a discussion earlier at lunch on this. Um, legislating is expensive, and the cost and the time of the legislators should be valued very carefully before they have been given the green light to go ahead. So having said all of this, um, I move on to that. Um, now, I have been playing with these different softwares for the purposes of my students, for the purposes of making the audience a little bit more engaged, but also because this, these are the things that we are concerned with. Um, I generated this a while ago for my students, and I gave it a prompt of an image of Snoopy on the Statue of Liberty eating an ice cream. And this is with um, stable diffusion. Now, we can have a long or short discussion whether this resembles Snoopy a lot or, or not, but we all feel where this is going and what kind of issues right holders may have. So, I will focus today, uh, with the time that I'm given, I will focus on the input questions. And I have dared to say that, to me, this appeared to be the more important issues because, yes, we do have questions and problems with the output. Is the AI-generated output protected with copyright? If it isn't, should it be? In what circumstances it is? And I'm not undermining that issue. I wrote a whole PhD thesis on that. So I would like to focus on the input for the other reason that I think the two are very much related. 
We're seeing this now in litigation. But the question of who is liable if something goes wrong when you're training your system is very tightly connected to the question of protectability. This is inherent in copyright systems and um, I would like to therefore focus a little bit my, our attention onto that. And not for other very, very mysterious reason, but because we have litigation ongoing in the US, as you know, but also in the UK. Uh, to, my, to my awareness, there is one case currently in the UK at the moment. There might be more in the making. And that concerns, again, a lot of the input. So, the input. These AI systems, and I, I have to admit, I really dislike the term AI. It is very misleading, artificial and intelligent. Uh, these are two words that really created a lot of buzz, but please let's stick to that and we can have a whole different conference on what is a better term. But AI systems are generally incapable of creating works without the access to human source material. So the things that we see, text to image generation usually, um, thrive on the crucial aspect of existing, many times, copyright protected works that this system is fed with. Regardless of which jurisdiction you're in, the system operates on the basis of several acts of copying. So there are different moments that different types of reproductions take place. There's interesting studies, breaking down some of these technologies and identifying the moments in which a work is copied there. Some of these moments, for some of them, we may have a solution in many countries, in all of the European Union, um, there is the temporary copies exception. But there are many other moments in which the copy is not temporary. And the question becomes whether all of these reproductions are actually infringing acts. So this is the background to this big input issue that we have been talking about today and in general. And now I'd like to turn to the UK. The UK has been mentioned by, um, by the speakers earlier today. There are four things, broadly speaking, in the UK system when we discuss the input for AI-generated works. We have, I call it, a useless provision in the copyright law. It's useless for commercial purposes. It's useful for non-commercial, but we talk about businesses and markets here, so it is useless, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, there was a public consultation that, we, that was mentioned earlier today. I will unpack it a little bit with you. There's an ongoing litigation between um, Getty Images and Stability AI, currently uh, in the High Court in London. I haven't heard of any signs of this lawsuit being settled, so what I hear from the practitioners involved, as much as I can hear because they can't really talk much, is that they're going forward. Um, and finally, the fourth piece of the puzzle are stakeholder roundtables. And this is something very, very interesting, um, and I'll spend a few words on that. Now, the useless provision. So, in the copyright law in the UK, we work with this act called the Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1988. It's a relatively old piece of legislation. It has been revised several times. The numbering makes absolutely no sense to anyone who reads numbers, regardless of what form of numbers you read. Um, it's a very difficult piece of legislation to read and to make sense of, but it includes 
a provision. It includes an exception for text and data analysis for non-commercial research. It does not talk about AI. There's no mention in the entire act of artificial intelligence. This provision entered the Copyright Act in 2014. It predates the boom of AI that we're living nowadays. But reading it a little bit, there might be certain signs that are helpful, at least for non-commercial purposes. However, as we said, for commercial purposes, this is useless because we have the requirement for lawful access and it's a, this one is a little bit open to interpretation as to what does it mean that a person who makes a copy must have lawful access to the work. Um, there seems to be one interpretation stemming from the European directives and a slightly different one in the uh, UK. Nonetheless, the big barrier for commercial operators is the fact that all of this has to be done for the sole purpose of research for a non-commercial purpose. And on top of it, uh, we need sufficient acknowledgement um, unless this proves to be impossible for reasons of practicality or otherwise. There is a bit of case law in the United Kingdom on what a sufficient acknowledgement means. Uh, but this one, let's say, it might be a little bit easier to, to go ahead. And another interesting piece of this exception is that it is uh, mandatory in the sense that it cannot be overridden by contract. Not good enough for AI, not good enough for generative AI, not good enough for mid-journey, stability AI, and so on and so forth. What did the UK do then? Why am I even here? So, they did something interesting. They carried out this public consultation towards the end of 2020. It closed in the very beginning of 2021. Anyone could reply to it. I replied with my colleagues at my former institution. There was a lot of research bodies. There was a lot of right holder representative bodies. In total, around 60 out responses were given, which only gives you the comparison to what Andrew was saying earlier. Um, I think people will be a little bit more engaged now, but of course the dimensions between the UK and the US in terms of population are also different. This consultation is coming at a very interesting time in the UK because we live there in a post-Brexit world, so if we want, we can do whatever we want. We don't need to follow the EU anymore. And the EU has done a few things. I'm not touching them today, but this is basically the, the, the way that the UK is pushing this forward is we don't need to follow the very, very long, burdensome legislative process that we were bound by in the European Union for these things. We can do things on our own. And in addition to that post-Brexit reality, there is the... AI reality in which the United Kingdom is really determined in becoming a global leader for AI. Like every single country in the world, they've stuck it out there with their AI national strategy. Boldly. Um, but this is, the, this is the background to it. This is very interesting that the UK IP office is doing a wonderful job in this respect. Uh, so they're not putting it as I'm an academic so I can tell you directly what, what comes out of this. They don't tell you all of this in the document when you read it. Um, but this is the background to the whole consultation. Three things were studied there, like uh, Mira was telling earlier, the text and data mining exception that I just showed you. Should we reform it in one way or another? And this is what I will spend the rest of my time on. They looked at computer generated works so section 9.3 of the Copyright Designs and Patents Act. Should that one be changed? And like Mira again was saying, um, the conclusion there was, let's just leave it. And the third thing is patent inventorship. All driven by Mr. Thaler and his um, team. 
So when it came down to um, the text and data mining exception, you don't need to read all of this. Um, you have it in your booklets, but I want you to focus only on the first point. point. They were given options, so it's a very interesting document that uh, accompanies the public consultation, which I found quite comprehensive um, in the sense that it outlined different costs and benefits for different stakeholders when it came to the different options that the UK IPO was proposing. Now, for option number one that was put forward was to improve the licensing environment. Can we actually get licensing for text and data mining right? And a question in the consultation related to whether the respondents have any experience with TDM licensing in a commercial, non-commercial context. Can they provide licensing models? Some insight as to how this is working. And really, the UK IPO really, really, really was hoping they would get enough replies on point one. I have a feeling that they really wanted to go for option number one when the consultation was out. The reality is that they got zero evidence. Barely, I don't think anyone actually submitted um, a licensing model or any insights as to how licensing works. Whether that's because these things are confidential, they don't want to share it, them, it's very valuable information, or because they don't have experience, or because very few people replied, there might be a combination of all of these reasons, there was simply not enough evidence. But when you read the documents, at least I got the feeling that the IP office really desperately wanted to get this. And the story goes on, so you see why this is confirmed in my view. However, when you look a little bit at the replies um, of, the, um, of the consultation, I have picked out the BBC here, uh, the UK's national broadcaster. When it came down to licensing, they said that even they, this is the, the, the the UK's national broadcaster said, the cost of licensing third-party data sets uh, is too high. So they use their own data sets, they tried to use their own one, and they had only three projects where they relied on external data. The projects are listed, one is with the University of Edinburgh and two others related to something else. So there was no guiding case law which would foster the legal certainty that they needed. And as it currently stands, uh, they commented that the UK text and data mining exception is unhelpful from a sound business model for the use of vast quantities of copyright works in a single project. Users clearly were unsurprisingly said that they were priced out of licensing for research projects um, and they found all of these arrangements to be very costly and unworkable so barely any evidence here desperate situation so what did the UK IPO do, do on the basis of these comments they decided to move forward with a wide and text, text, and, text and data mining exception for all purposes, with no opt-out. And everyone was shocked. And I'm glad to hear uh, that this was not shocking just to the UK music industry or just to the UK publishers uh, industry, but also to the Korean. Um, because the story unfolded in a very similar manner. This very wide text and data mining for all purposes, commercial, non-commercial, with no possibility to opt out, got a lot of negative um, publicity amongst the music industry, like I said, and the, um, the voices criticizing it reached the policymakers. So, 
UK Music's chief outlined a lot of threats to music, uh, of text and data mining, and the publishers were also very, very unhappy with this. So what happened is that the government rolled back and they said, we're going to think about it, sorry. <laughs> we're not going to introduce this just yet. We might, they didn't promise, they said, we might carry out another public consultation to figure this out better, but we are not proposing the big wide sweeping exception. In the meantime, the courts got busy and Getty Images launched its lawsuit in the High Court against Stability AI. So every week there was something happening on this topic in the UK. There was a very busy year, I would, I would say. That case um, talks a lot about the money. So the total sums expended on investment in obtaining, verifying, presenting the content, contents on the Getty Images database look as follows. I'm not going to repeat the numbers, but they're very high. It's not always about the money. I want to make this statement in copyright law. I have argued very, very strongly that it is also a lot about culture, and we should not forget this. But reading a little bit the particulars of the claim by Getty Images, it turns out that it's a lot about money, it's a lot about licensing. And the type of works that Stable Diffusion in its two versions actually thrives on, um, Getty Images has identified that in 1.0, there were 12 million visual assets, of which around 7.3 million are copyright protected works. And it's 2.0 version from the 7.5 million visual assets, around 4.4 million are copyright protected works. There's not a detailed explanation as to how are they protected and, and what kind of works there are. That's a completely different story, but the, the particulars of the claim go a little bit into that direction, as well as the training process is explained there. So how does um, Stability AI basically use these works to train its system? Now, while all of this is happening, the government decided not to, do, um, not to introduce the big exception, and the case went to court something else started to emerge in the policy discussions. So different pieces of strategies from the UK IPO and the government started appearing, where there is, in one of them, there is a very strong emphasis, this pro-innovation regulation of technologies review um, on the, of the digital technologies focuses on three aspects. The three, it's going to be a three-step approach if we want to face these issues. They say that we need to be flexible in our regulation and we need divergence at the very early stage of the emerging technologies. Experimentation is encouraged. So all of this talk that the European Union has on sandboxes, this is starting to appear a little bit here. So we need, they say, to, to, to test different approaches. It's not just going to be legislation and that's it. And all of this is then hopefully going to be um, exported internationally and seek some sort of international regulatory harmonization. Now, this is the big goal. More on the copyright and AI things, and I'm, I'm very conscious of time. Um, there is this attempt for a code of practice. This is ongoing. So, um, the hope is that the UK IPO is currently holding, they, they started running these round tables from around May onwards. They're still ongoing. 
And this is going to be some sort of a multi-regulator AI sandbox and clear policy position. A guidance, a non-binding guidance, code of practice to provide guidance to support AI firms to access copyright work as an input for their model, while at the same time ensuring that the protection to right holders remains. So it's striking this balance between the right holders and the, user, and the, uh, and the AI firms. Very well said, it needs to be proportionate. And then we'll go on to, the, the office has published actually those that are involved in these roundtables. We have a um, working group of memberships, and you see the parties that are involved, the stakeholders. Now, I have asked this question several times. How did they get selected? From my perspective as an academic who is really keen on balanced, inclusive, transparent process and legislation, we talked about process and procedure so much with my colleagues these days, um, how did these Good, good selection, I'm not criticizing the selection, it might even be the one that you need, but nowhere did I find any indication as to call for participation. Open to the public. It's a good mix at first sight. There is the industry, there are the right holders, I think there's even a few bodies that advocate for, uh, for the general public, for access to works and so on and so forth. But this is not very inclusive and transparent, at least from, from my perspective. Um, when they carried out the consultation, there was a call, official public call on the website. Uh, we heard from Andrew when the US, uh, I think the, the UK IPO can learn a lot from the US Copyright Office uh, in that respect. So all of this inclusivity is really missing here. And not because I'm an academic, but where are the academics? I know we create problems many times, but we are generally reasonable people. So one or two of us there, not me, pick my colleagues. I think it, it should be a little bit more nuanced. I'm still waiting, I'll tell you if they reply to me. Um, let's see what they say. Now, the aim of this um, is to basically make licenses for data mining more available. So it's going back to option number one that the UK IPO really, really wanted to push forward. So um, I think these listening sessions that the US Copyright Office has held might be very, very helpful in this respect um, for this code of practice because they really hoping to overcome the barriers that AI firms and users currently face. The language is still very general, um, but targeting this to the different sectors, listening to the different sectors, um, might be a very, very good starting point. Um, and this is also evident in the tasks that they have identified. I'm not criticizing it here because I think the tasks are very right to be there, but they're still on the very broad general level. So the hope is that this code of practice will identify on the one hand the creator concerns relating to the use of copyright works and so on. It will identify the barriers to access and it will hopefully set out commitments and expectations in relation to all of this business. Now, I said, I want to finish with this, that I don't think copyright is just for the market. I think it's, all, it's a lot about culture and access and many of the voices that need to be there, that need to be part of the discussion are just not given the chance to be there as the general public, we, not as someone working for a certain institution, as creators and as, as human beings, if copyright is for human beings, we need to have a say in it. Um, and it is not easy to make these laws. Despite all of this that I have said, I still think that the code of practice might be a good approach, if got right, if, if they get it right. The process is important though, how it works and the transparency of it is essential. And thank you very much, I'm gonna stop here.
Thank you very much for your informative presentation. 네, 이렇게 해서 영국의 정책 노력. Uh, thank you very much. We have heard about the policy making efforts in UK. And we heard also from Korea and the US. And I'd like to thank once again the three presenters for your presentations. Seoul Copyright Forum 2023. Uh, now we are heading to the second part of the second session. So we will listen to the first presentation of the second part of the second session, uh, which will cover the policy efforts to balance copyright protection and industry development in Singapore. Uh, please welcome uh, Gavin Fu, the head of the copyright unit of the legal department of the IPO of Singapore. Please welcome him with a big hand. Very good afternoon to everyone. Let me start by expressing my deep appreciation to the Korea Copyright Commission and the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism for organizing this event, event uh, inviting me to speak, and of course for your excellent hospitality. It's truly a privilege to be able to share Singapore's perspective on generative AI with fellow experts at this prestigious forum. Generative AI has taken the world by storm, and much of the current discussions have been dominated by how AI can be used to create expressive content like music, books, and art. So I have a prompt of my own. Before coming here, I asked a generative AI model to imagine what a famous landmark in Singapore would look like in the style of one of my favorite artists, Yayoi Kusama from Japan. So the result is this delightful, whimsical image of Singapore's gardens by the bay in Kusama's signature bright colors, polka dots, and of course, her iconic pumpkin. For those of you who may be less familiar with these references, you can see the actual super trees in Singapore's gardens by the bay in the photographs on the right. So as all of you know, for generative AI to have such capabilities, it must be trained on a very large corpus of works, some of which are likely to be protected by copyright. So for today, I'll be focusing on the input side of generative AI, how Singapore's exception for text and data mining, which we call the computational data analysis exception, facilitates development of generative AI. Our exception is unique for being one of the only exceptions in the world that expressly recognize the use of copyright works for machine learning. So before delving into this, I do also want to emphasize that at the same time, the computational data analysis exception can also be used to support other text and data mining applications. Generating expressive works is just one aspect of AI. Such users capture our imagination and help us push the boundaries of creativity. But the question is, is that all there is? At the moment, we have been very focused on how generative AI can be used to create expressive works. But there are many applications of machine learning that do not seem to get as much attention in the mainstream. So even as we focus on generative AI today, let's also be mindful of the potentially broader users of a text and data mining exception in supporting data-driven innovation beyond generative AI. So here's an outline of my presentation. I'll start by giving you some background to the computational data analysis exception, how it came about, why we introduced it. Then I'll go on to give you an overview of the exception and its key features. Then I will share about how the exception has been received since it came into force. 
And finally, some applications of machine learning and generative AI in Singapore. First, some background. The exception was introduced in Singapore's new Copyright Act, the Copyright Act 2021, on the 21st of November 2021. So it's coming close to about two years now. It was introduced as part of a larger reform of Singapore's copyright laws and policies. This was the most comprehensive review of our copyright legislation in more than 30 years, since our original Copyright Act was enacted in 1987. This review updated Singapore's laws to respond to the technological and market developments of the digital age. We introduced new rights and remedies to ensure that we continue to reward the creation of works and incentivize creativity. At the same time, we introduced new exceptions to ensure that works are reasonably available for societal benefit and to support innovation. One such exception was the tax and data mining exception. So the idea for this exception was first publicly mooted in August 2016. That's when we launched our very first public consultation in the copyright review. The technological and market landscape then was markedly different from the current one now. In 2016, the focus was on the use of text and data mining to find patterns, trends, and other useful information from big data. The example that we gave in our public consultation was the use of text and data mining for sentiment analysis, such as scanning blog posts to derive insights. In terms of the legal landscape, we already had fair use then. And we knew that based on the Google Books decision in America, there was a possibility that text and data mining could be considered fair use in Singapore. However, there was still uncertainty that impacted our researchers and businesses, especially because of the highly fact-specific nature of fair use. You've already heard from some of the earlier speakers about the potential unpredictability of fair use. And in Singapore, where copyright is not heavily litigated, the likelihood of getting guidance from our courts was thought to be low, and that indeed is still the case now. So from then until the time we brought the exception into force about five years later in 2021, the predominant use cases for computational data analysis have evolved. So as we all know, Technological developments in this field have been exponential with ChatGPT and other gen generative AI technologies. A recent article in the Washington Times aptly sums up this evolution. It says that for decades, AI has mostly been used for analysis, trawling huge sets of data to find patterns. But a boom in generative AI, which uses this pattern matching to create words, images, and sounds, has opened up new possibilities. And the increased sophistication of AI image generation technology is readily apparent from the images that you see on the slide. And when you look back, it's really fascinating to see how far we've come. So is this why we introduced the exception in Singapore? Or were there other reasons? I would say that the impetus for our exception can be traced to our larger objective of supporting Singapore's drive to catalyze data-driven innovation and growth in the digital economy, including what we call our Smart Nation Initiative. So essentially, Smart Nation is a key nation-building strategy that endeavors to transform Singapore through technology and effect change throughout the government, economy, and society we firmly believe that going digital is a national imperative and that will allow us to capture the growth opportunities in the fourth industrial revolution. So with that backdrop, it should then not come as a surprise that when the exception was debated in Parliament, there was a strong sentiment among the lawmakers that the exception would be necessary to support AI and machine learning the Minister for Law emphasised that the exception would support our Smart Nation initiatives, our push towards data-driven innovation, 
and our efforts to grow our AI and technology sectors. Other members of Parliament also expressed similar sentiments in supporting the exception, as you can see from the quotes. So when the exception became law, the Software Alliance, which counts as its members Microsoft and IBM, called it a game changer for bringing much needed legal certainty to the AI development, developers. They emphasized that many of the most promising applications of machine learning, including computer vision and natural language processing, rely on training data that may be subject to copyright protection. And so this exception helps resolve a source of uncertainty for the Singaporean AI research and development community. And that's precisely what we wanted. I mentioned earlier about the uncertainty of relying on fair use for text and data mining. And the computational data analysis exception has helped us bring some balance to address this shortcoming. So with that background, let me give you an overview of the exception and its key features that are shown on this slide. First, the exception covers all types of subject matter that is protected in the Copyright Act, literary works, artistic works, musical works, films, sound recordings, and so on. And this is an important starting point, as we wanted to maximize the applications of the exception across all industries. What we did not want was to discriminate against particular types of copyright works, as this would preempt innovation on the basis of short-sighted assumptions as to which categories of works may or may not be suitable for text and data mining. Next, the exception is limited to acts of copying and communication. I thought, we thought it was important to limit the exception to acts of copying or communication because these are the two key rights that are involved in text and data mining, and that's as opposed to having the exception apply to all exclusive rights. Where copying is concerned, copies can be made for the purpose of computational data analysis, including storing or retaining the copies for such analysis. Where communication is concerned, the exception only allows communication in very narrow circumstances, i.e., verifying the results of the computational data analysis or collaborative research or study relating to the analysis. The original works or copies cannot be communicated to any party in any other circumstances. And in fact, as I will come to shortly, if this is done, even the copying cannot benefit from the exception and will be infringing. So we start to see some features that help to create balance within the exception. I next come to a very crucial condition for the exception to apply, and that is the copies made must be made only for the purposes of computational data analysis and no other purposes. The question then is, what is computational data analysis? And the fundamental premise for our exception is that one, data is not protected by copyright, and two, use of copyright works for text and data mining is non-consumptive or non-expressive use. Such activities do not consume, trade on, or compete with the expressive value of the underlying materials. And you see this concept embodied in the definition in section 243 of our Copyright Act, which refers to using the works as information or data, or extracting information or data from the works. So under section 243, computational data analysis is defined non-exhaustively to include using a computer program to identify, extract, and analyze information or data from a work, and using the work as an example of a type of information or data to improve the functioning of a computer program in relation to that type of information or data. The exception expressly recognizes the use of the exception to train AI models and gives an illustration of using images
to train a computer program to recognize images. So this definition and illustration is what gives certainty to the AI research and development community that they can use the exception to conduct machine learning, which we all know is fundamental to generative AI. So let me now turn to the next feature of the exception, which is that both commercial and non-commercial users are allowed. And this was important for us because in our view, there isn't always a clear line between whether something is commercial or non-commercial in nature. Something can start off as being non-commercial in nature, but it can evolve to being commercial in nature. And the use of the exception would be hampered if users cannot be sure whether the court would find that their activities are commercial in nature, or worse still, subject their subsequent commercialization efforts to an injunction or other infringement remedies. And more importantly, given that text and data mining is fundamentally non-expressive use, whether or not it involves commercial users becomes secondary. So the next feature is the safeguard I alluded to earlier. Section 2442C provides that a condition for the exception to apply is that the user must generally not supply the copies made to any person. The only two circumstances where this is allowed are what I said earlier, verifying the results of the analysis or collaborative research or study. If the copies made are provided to a third party for any other purpose, the use will be infringing. And this is an important safeguard because it ensures that we continue to protect the rights owners' markets and require their licensees to obtain access to works lawfully. And that brings me to a key safeguard against abuse of the exception, the requirement for users to have lawful access. Now, if a user does not have lawful access to the works that are used for computational data analysis, the use will be infringing. We've already heard a little bit about the lawful access requirement. You see it in the EU, the UK. And this is a critical condition that serves to preserve and protect rights owners, commercial interests, and freedom to conduct business based on licensing and subscription models. So when is access not lawful? Section 2442D gives two examples of what constitutes lawful access. First, a user does not have lawful access if the user accessed the copy by circumventing paywalls. So for example, if you need to, if it's a database that requires you to subscribe to gain access to it, you have to subscribe to access it. You cannot, for example, hack the database on the basis of this exception. A user also does not have lawful access if the user accesses the database in breach of the terms of use. So another condition that prevents the exception from being abused is that the use of infringing copies is restricted. This addresses one of the main concerns that rights owners raised in the public consultations to us, that the exception has a potential to legitimize the use of infringing content and other unlawful acts. So where unlawful acts are concerned, we have the lawful access condition. But related to this was also the question of how this lawful access condition would treat the use of infringing copies. Is it fair to say that a user does not have lawful access and would be deprived of the benefit of the exception if the user did not know he was using infringing copies? So because of these issues and questions, we decided to decouple the lawful access requirement from the require, requirement relating to use of infringing copies, although they are related. So the general position is that users cannot carry out computational data analysis on copies that they know are infringing. And that is the basic position because the exception should not be seen as endorsing infringement with knowledge. There's a small caveat to this, which is what you see in LIM 3. 
A user can use infringing copies knowingly if it is necessary for a prescribed purpose. And you might be wondering then, when would it ever be necessary to use infringing copies? And you'd be right to do so. There are probably very few legitimate reasons for this. And the only purpose that is prescribed in our law at the moment is research or study relating to rights infringement. So it really is a very niche situation where a researcher needs to extract or analyze information or data from infringing copies to get insights relating to infringement, such as what types or genres of works are most commonly pirated and on what platforms. So other than this niche situation, any knowing use of infringing copies will prevent the user from benefiting from the exception. This also extends to the situation in LIM2, where a user does not have specific knowledge that a particular copy is infringing, but knew or could reasonably have known that a copy was obtained from a flagrantly infringing online location. In such cases, the user also cannot benefit from the exception. And this was our way of trying to strike that balance between not legitimizing the use of infringing content on the one hand and not imputing such a high level of knowledge on users such that it becomes too onerous for them to use the exception. And that would be the case if, for example, users are required to do due diligence on every work within the large corpus of materials intended for data mining. So the last feature of our exception that I wish to cover today is the limits to using contracts to exclude or restrict users from benefiting from the exception. Under Section 187 of the Copyright Act, the computational data analysis exception cannot be excluded or restricted by contract, any contract term that purports directly or indirectly to exclude or restrict the exception is void to that extent. And we felt it is important not to allow private contractual provisions to override this exception given by Parliament because the benefit of data analysis improves with the completeness of the underlying data. Having specific databases locked out of the analysis because of contractual restrictions would make the results less useful or worse, create bias or inaccuracies. And especially in the context of developing AI, we can see that that's the last thing that you want. So I asked a generative AI model to create images of 21st century workers. On the left, European workers, and on the right, African workers. And it would be immediately apparent that the images on the left are hopeful, positive, futuristic even, whereas with the images on the right, they seem to reinforce the notion of Africa as a backward and impoverished continent. The overall mood of the images is bleak, and the workers are shown to be suffering or with skulls on their faces. And this isn't an isolated example. There are numerous reports about generative AI creating content that is skewed to reinforcing particular racial, gender, or other stereotypes such as this. So when the existing data sets already have certain biases, and you further exclude some data through contractual restrictions, there is a danger that this may further perpetuate the stereotypes in the content that is generated by AI. A related point I want to make on the features of the exception is its relationship with fair use. As I mentioned earlier, we also have the fair use exception in Singapore, and potentially this exception can also be used to support tax and data mining users. We have four mandatory factors that the Singapore courts will consider, as you see on the slide, similar to the US. And tax and data mining activities may potentially be exempted under fair use, under the computational data analysis exception, or both, as long as the conditions in the relevant exception are met. 
And this is due to the operation of Section 184 of our Copyright Act, which provides that the exception is generally independent of and does not affect the application of any other exception, even on the same facts. So now I want to share with you about how our exception has been received in the close to two years since it came into force. We tracked the industry and critical reception to the exception as borne out in close to about 30 commentaries published from 2021 to 2023 across a diverse range of sources, which include articles in law and scientific journals, trade publications, blog posts, press releases, legal updates, and so on. And we found that stakeholders and commentators generally focused on three main things. First, the scope of the exception, including how it compares with other tax and data mining exceptions around the world, whether it's too narrow, too broad, whether it's well balanced. And on this point, the middle ground was that the exception is indeed broad enough to support tax and data mining users. There was some commentary from foreign associations representing rights owners that the exception is too broad, and the aspect of the exception that gave them the greatest concern was the limitations against contractual restrictions. Second, clarity of the exception and whether it provides certainty, including given the availability of fair use in Singapore. This morning, we've already heard about how important it is to have certainty in your laws. And in this area, by and large, there was a strong sense that the specific exception is necessary and helpful for Singapore because it provides that sort of certainty. And you've seen the quote I gave you just now from the Software Alliance. Singapore's tax and data binding framework can be described as a hybrid one where you have the generality of fair use and also the specific part of the computational data analysis exception. And the third point is compatibility of the exception with the three-step test. And there was some contention about whether given the scope of the exception, um, it would be compatible with the three-step test. So I thought I would share this with you to give you some insight into the key perspectives to consider when thinking about a tax and data mining exception that can facilitate machine learning and other applications of AI. So with that, I come to the last part of my presentation, which is to share with you some examples of machine learning and generative AI applications in Singapore and how they have been used to improve everyday life. So in 2022, Singapore launched an online translation portal called SG Translate Together, which is operated by the Singapore government. It generates localized translations in Singapore's four official languages and uses machine learning to improve the quality of the translations. Users can submit their post-edited translations to further train the underlying machine translation engine. And compared to more generic translation engines, this portal is particularly beneficial for locals because it can produce localized translations that are contextualized for a Singaporean audience and can properly translate local concepts and terms. And this ensures that important information, news, announcements can quickly reach as wide an of an audience as possible, especially the older segments of our society that tend to be less fluent in English. So the screenshot on this page shows the translation in action. It is an English to Chinese translation of an article explaining the concept of a smart nation to the public and sharing with them how they can contribute. Such users maximize citizen engagement on our national initiatives and minimize the likelihood of technological transformation leaving behind certain segments of society. So our experience is that an enabling ecosystem not only facilitates digital transformation in the public sector, but perhaps more importantly, creates a trickle-down effect to innovation activities in the private sector. So for example, in the banking sector alone, 
In the past six months, Singapore banks have launched various AI and generative AI initiatives that are built on machine learning technology, such as their own versions of ChatGPT, their in-house career development platforms, and AI bots that peruse news articles and market movements to generate tips and stock recommendations. We engaged with one of Singapore's largest banks, OCBC, on the computational data analysis exception, and they shared with us the quote that you see on the screen. They shared that the exception is very useful for their future developments in the AI space. It helps them to increase the adoption of AI across banking services and deliver greater customer value through AI-driven solutions. And this is what we mean when we say we want to have a smart nation that leverages digital technology. And this is the sort of impactful, wide-ranging and beneficial applications that are shared with you today, beyond just generative AI, which we hope can come out from the computational data analysis exception. So finally, as we look towards the future, we are also mindful of the concerns from the other side of the fence concerns from creators and rights owners, for example, about being remunerated when their works are used as training data, or concerns that their works will be used to create potentially competing works that could affect their livelihood. We see immense value in the computational data analysis exception, but also appreciate these perspectives and concerns. They remind us of the need to consider and balance the various viewpoints as we continue to monitor the rapidly changing AI scene and the different ways that businesses adopt to, to change, adapt to change. And with that, it leaves me to thank everybody for your attention. I look forward to engaging further with you during the panel discussion and throughout the rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you very much for your elucidating presentation. We heard about the Singapore's cases uh, regarding copyright and AI. So we are listening to the similar yet different approaches of the different countries on this uh, same topic of Gen AI and copyright. Why don't we come back to uh, Korea as we uh, hand over the floor to Professor Hesun Yoon for the presentation on intersections between AI governance and copyright law. Please welcome Professor with a big round of applause. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hesun Yoon, as was just introduced. My, um, I am professor of the Hanyang University. I'd like to first of all congratulate on the successful and full house hosting of the Seoul Copyright Forum, and I'm very glad to be here. So uh, when I first got the invitation to speak, I said, were you really wanting to get hold of me because I uh, did not major in copyright and I actually majored in administrative law and I think half of my presentation today is going to be about AI governance so that is actually my field of expertise not so much about the copyright I attended law school in Canada and after law school I became an attorney at law in Canada and I uh, had started my practice an IT boutique firm, a small boutique firm in Canada and I thought that copyright law is really difficult so I don't want to you know, start my career in copyright but then here I am at the Seoul Copyright Forum talking about the interaction and um, the connecting points between AI and copyright. And so that was a little bit about myself. And so hopefully I won't be too criticized by the audience here today after my presentation. But anyway, um, today, well, when I got my invitation, I started to prepare for my presentation. And I don't have that kind of level of depth of in copyright as the other presenters. but. I came to realize the importance of AI governance in relation to copyright. And so I wanted to look uh, once again on the role of the copyright law within the AI governance. And it allowed me f uh, to have another opportunity to um, look deeper into this issue on a personal level as well. So first of all, 
I'm going to be approaching from a slightly different perspective about the copyright law and AI governance. So I'm first of all going to talk about the importance of AI governance and the general aspects of it. And then I'm going to go on to the intersection between AI governance and copyright law. So copyright law exists in the middle of around or around AI governance. So I want to see the interaction between the two sides. And then I'm going to go on to looking at the um, different jurisdictions regarding AI diff governance. So I want to introduce some of the major aspects in the different countries, but um, I also wanted to introduce what kind of perspectives exist in those jurisdictions in regard to AI governance and copyright. And fourthly, I would just like to give um, some of my suggestions as an expert, not so much in copyright, but in go AI governance. So um, yes, I'd like to propose some ways forward and uh, policies regarding AI governance. And I would say that there are four or five different aspects of why AI governance is important. So the first is historical and theoretical perspectives. AI is uh, AI governance is important, and that's because uh, about the um, relationship and the interaction between re regulation and technology and innovation and technology. And so whenever there was a new innovative technology, there were institutions that allowed it for it to be accepted in society. And through those institutions, um, many countries promoted industrial revolutions and technological revolutions, and even the digital technology and say, has always been a growth promoted uh, during a transitional period. And so I think that would also go for AI as well. So the innovation has to be accepted within society and take root in our society. And in that regard, we need a set of regulations and a governance structure for AI to be widely accepted and adopted in society. Um, in July, in the UK, the House of Commons uh, re relevant committee came up with an interim report about the governance of AI. So I got this quote from that interim report, uh, basically emphasizing that uh, their safeguards has to be in place to protect public interest and public policy is important. So, but then we have to go back to the question of what governance is. And just with that topic, I think we can have an entire day of conferencing and discussion. So it's rather an abstract and very complex kind of concept. But I would say that it's a set of systems, organizations, and institutional and technological decision-making system that allows for a certain technology to uh, take root in a particular society. Uh, and then there's a second uh, kind of importance, and this is the um, uh, phenomenological perspective. Many of the developed countries are actually in a very heated competition over establishing an AI regulatory governance. So on one hand, there is the effort to forge an ecosystem for this technology and technological development, and also coming up with international standards, and also trying to um, exert global leadership on the technology side. And then on the other side, you also have the attempts of different governance, comp governments competing to set up governance structures uh, to make that technology socially acceptable. Then there's the legitimacy perspective. AI governance is important in terms of its legitimacy because from the governance perspective and also from the legislature's perspective, uh, they have the duty and obligation to be able to convince their uh, population regarding the um, fundamental aspects of AI. But this, I think, is quite obvious, so I won't spend too much time on this. But um, legitimacy is really important because, you know, they're the vi possible violation of fundamental rights. Um, it can exacerbate discrimination. 
and biased AI can worsen the existing discrimination, and um, there is a potential to increase social disruption. And so there are many calls for stronger regulations of uh, AI. And on the other side, um, people say that we need to make use of this new technology for social benefits, but then also there is the issue of responsibility and liability. And because AI is seen as like a black box, we need to enhance transparency. transparency. So in the beginning, the discussion around AI regulation and governance was basically around soft law. So there were the voluntary code of practice, or there were stronger professional ethics emphasized by experts. And so it was a soft law approach before the release of chat GPT. But then in 2019, there was a bit of a transition. Many uh, countries started to talk about legislation and moving away with just an eth ethical uh, discussion about uh, regulating AI. The major driver of this kind of transition was obviously the release of the EU because EU came up with a AI bill uh, and started to talk about AI governance and that really triggered the discussion about AI governance. But then there was another factor that really fueled the debate and that was the release of the chat GPT. Since we're talking mainly about generative AI today, well, I would say that generative AI is basically general, meaning that it can be adopted in many different industries. And many people say that generative AI is going to break down the borders between the various disciplines and industries. And so we believe that social, environmental, and economical risks can um, come out of this kind of generative AI, meaning that uh, governance really need to speed up the process of establishing AI governance. Um, so yes, the EU also revised its bill quite extensively after the release of ChatGPT, and many governments around the world are also thinking very deeply about um, regulating generative AI. Um, China is also um, legislating, it's actually a temporary legislation regarding generative AI. And in July, it's going to be enacted, it has been enacted, and it's going to be enforced quite soon. And so now let me go over the different uh, aspects on generative AI that AI governance structures are focusing on. So I think many um, presenters have talked about the data and the copyright over data. So that's one big issue. Another thing is the um, issue of content. The fact that fake content can be generated and it's really difficult to manage that kind of content. And the third is that um, the credit and verifying the origin is really difficult. And there is also the um, IPR related issues like plagiarism and copyright infringement. The fifth issue is a little bit more abstract, but um, there's also the issue regarding the universality of Jack. ChatGPT. So because ChatGPT and generative AI can be used anywhere, we don't know where the risks are going to appear. And the sixth issue is that um, certain companies are leading the technology, and so um, fair trade issues and antitrust related issues could also arise. And so uh, hopefully I've been quite convincing that AI governance is definitely necessary. And so now let me go on to the um, intersection between AI governance and copyright law. So when I say that we have to establish AI governance, I said that in the beginning it was more about code of conduct. It was more of a soft law approach. So that was the main aspects of the discussion. And at that time, in the beginning, the um, discussion was not that fine-tuned. And so, yes, you can see this melting pot. Um, all of these different types of issues, like algorithmic bias and discrimination, transparency, attribution, control, all of these issues were all mixed up in this melting pot. 
And so the discussion was also not very fine-tuned because it was a soft law approach and because it was really more about ethics rather than um, regulation and law. But within this melting pot, you have some legal issues and regulatory issues. For example, liability, responsibility, and ethical issues were all jumbled up and mixed together. But then people started to focus a little bit more on the responsibility and the liability issue because of the copyright aspects. And so um, if if there is something generated, something good generated out of AI, who's going to reap the benefits? That's That became one of the most main issues. But nowadays, uh, the current uh, debate is around some other additional various issues. The slide here points to 12 different issues, and these 12 issues are from the AI governance interim report from the House of Commons that I mentioned before. And so that interim report uh, has actually outlined 12 different issues or different challenges. And you can see number eight is intellectual property and copyright. And so um, now I'm going to focus a little bit more on the intersection between AI governance and copyright law. So you can divide it into content perspective, a functional perspective, and a purpose uh, perspective. So in these three different realms, there are points of intersection between AI governance and copyright law. So basically, from a content perspective, the copyright law and copyright issues were ever present in AI governance discord, discourse. Uh, because, you know, there was always a question of is AI output copyrightable and who holds the copyright? So there was always this issue of attribution. And then when generative AI emerged, the copyright related issues uh, became a little bit more specific and became one definite part of AI governance. So are we going to be able to recognize the copyrightability of generative AI output? And what are we going to do about the violation of the infringement of copyright of the learning data used by the AI? And how are we going to protect the copyright holders of the works that have been utilized by the AI? So these are some of the issues that were raised. I believe that AI governance discourse is going to evolve, and as it invo evolves, then the copyright issues are also going to expand and become a little bit more uh, deeper and more detailed. And so we have to find a solution um, to these issues to be able to really set up a proper AI governance. And so then having thought about this question, I realized that there is also another point of intersection between AI governance and copyright law from a functional perspective. So from a functional perspective, uh, copyright law is one of the factors influencing the various variables in regard to AI innovation. So for example, you have the time and cost that is incurred while developing AI, which I think is quite closely related to copyright. The reason why we are here is because of what we're going to do about the learning data, right? So if we are not able to find a solution for copyright regarding learning data, then it's going to take longer to develop AI and it's going to be more costly because of there are going to be litigations. And also, setting up an AI governance structure is also to incentivize innovation and also reap fruit from it. And if we don't resolve the copyright-related issues, it will be difficult to get more benefits out of the innovations of AI. And as you can see, there's a lot of resistance from the right holders. And also, many people in the public are also quite weary of the works generated by AI and not by human beings. 
And so there's the issue of the social acceptability. And so, um, yes, copyright law is also important in terms of uh, social acceptability of AI. So if AI is going to move in the right direction, copyright law will indeed play a very important role within that governance structure. The second thing is about the international harmonization. So as you know, copyright law is quite different in many of the jurisdictions. It's very um, different because it prioritizes national interest. So you see the disparity also in AI governance, but I also believe that there is a need for international harmonizations between the different types of AI governance structure. And so if we were to have a good AI governance structure, then in a short period of time with less cost, we will be able to um, reap the services of many types of AI models, and we will be able to witness a diversification of the different services. And I think the road will be paved for exporting of those kind of services as well. And so I believe that um, efficiency has to be guaranteed. And so if the copyright law is able to play the role of advancing or paving the road uh, for AI innovations to be exported, then I think then um, AI will also be playing in the best interest of society and thereby also uh, benefit copyright law in turn. Uh, but then that also means that we have to uh, find solutions to some of the very real problems regarding copyright and AI governance. The real driver between the establishing of the AI governance structure is to promote more innovation and wider innovation. In other words, socialization of the AI technology. And so basically, we want to be able to build social trust in AI and foster an innovative ecosystem and therefore contribute to the public good by creating sustainable social, economic, and cultural values. So that could be the purpose of establishing an AI governance. But then what's the driver of legislating or copyright law? All of you know this really well. I believe that the driver behind why we have a copyright law is quite similar to the driver between AI governance. We want the socialization of the printing technology and expansion of human innovation and creativity. And with that, we are using printing technology. And so human innovation and creativity become more widespread. So this incentivization is common for both copyright law and AI governance. And so whether it be AI governance or copyright law, the, the socialization of new technology is the commonality. And so um, I think within the AI governance structure, we'll be able to also innovate the copyright law and also be able to guarantee and make stronger the original objective and purpose of the copyright law. So now let me look at some of the development of AI governance in major um, countries. So I won't go into details, uh, but point out some of the characteristics and how they perceive copyright law in relation to AI governance in the different countries. So in the case of EU, um, the, the draft came out on the 21st of April 2021, and then after the chat GPT in 5th of April, May on 2023, um, the, uh, an amendment was proposed, and so there is a trialogue taking place right now. And so it's a risk-based, uh, differentiated approach. And we go to the copyright law. The AI has actually taken into account the copyright law because the, the recital does explicitly mention that the copyright law has to be considered. And in the case of generative AI, the learning data and the use of copyrighted work um, 
if they are using copyrighted work, would be mandated to provide a summary. Now going on to the United States. AI could call. Well, there is no visible AI-related bill, but the US OSTP released a blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights. And according to projections, uh, we believe that the federal uh, Congress will release another bill later this year. The AI governance related bills never directly addressed copyright. Mostly the US Copyright Office is in charge of making copyright related policies and there are many lawsuits that are going on in the US. So depending on what decisions the judiciary takes, uh, we believe that legislation will change a lot and it seems like Congress is waiting to see the trends coming out of the judiciary uh, sector. And when it comes to the UK, uh, they announced they will not uh, make legislation uh, with regards to AI, but they changed the positions with the AI governance uh, report. According to the report, well, EU countries and the US are moving towards forming bills including other countries, so they felt the need to do so also, and they urged uh, the government, and they are aiming to do so within this uh, parliament period, and it risks, uh, it requires resolving the 12 requirements that I have elaborated. And in the UK, the TDM-related exemption is expected to be introduced, as I've inferred from the booklet, and the UK government is very innovation friendly in terms of their policies. So they are for uh, such provisions for AI innovation, but this report uh, put a break on such approach, striving to protect. So the UK parliament strive towards protecting the rights of the creators. And in China, third uh, law has uh, been implemented. So laws regarding the personal information protection law and algorithmic recommendation services and deep fake are currently in effect. And explicitly, uh, the China's laws uh, are oriented towards respecting and protecting copyright. And lawful data must be used and others uh, rights must not be infringed upon and the content itself must respect copyright this is the china stance so i really briefly uh, touched upon the ai governance of different countries and how uh, copyright related discourse is taking place in these different countries so just to wrap uh, my presentation Legislation for AI governance is expected to be introduced. Already 13 bills have been proposed in Korea, and the relevant National Assembly committees have drafted a bill. This means that while we are talking about digital economy, I think AI economy uh, is a more accurate expression. AI will form the future world order, and if so, the regulatory framework surrounding AI will be the top agenda for all countries. But as we've seen in the presentations, all countries are formulating their own suitable uh, AI governance. And while there were many bills introduced in Korea, I think there hasn't been complete and comprehensive in-depth uh, discourse has been conducted in Korea with regards to the justification and the intention for such uh, legislation. But still, AI technology advancement is taking pa uh, place at a very rapid pace. So we must engage in such discourse. And we must consider how the copyright regime should address these new issues. Well, when it comes to AI governance and the legal framework, I am not here to give you recommendations on whether copyright law should be incorporated in the governance, but at least we must keep the copyright law should keep pace with the discourse 
on AI governance. They should go in parallel. Or sometimes I think the copyright regime related discourse should outpace uh, that on AI governance. If we look at candies and the packaging, usually uh, they are uh, the wrap is squeezed at the two ends with the candy in the middle. I think that is a right analogy uh, to express how AI governance and copyright law bookend the AI uh, technological advance from two sides. I think copyright law related discussions should uh, really pick up the pace to perhaps outpace that on AI governance related discourse. And as the discourse should take place within the context of national circumstances, I still believe that there should be an international uh, perspective. Well, the synchronization extent and the harmonization is very important when it comes to copyright policies. So we should make use of such forum to really in, have an international discussion on how to build AI governance and uh, copyright regimes so that there is an intercompatibility uh, uh, among the countries and provide a solid foundation for capacity building in co the copyright uh, sector that is in pace with the technological development in AI. And I was asked to make policy recommendations. And I would like to emphasize that this is coming from an administrative standpoint who is not in the copyright field, uh, maybe giving you a novel or fresh take on this issue. So please keep that in mind. Well, maintaining the current copyright law or even strengthening it is necessary from my standpoint. To elaborate, as AI technology continues to advance, they will cr create more works. This means that the value of the work created by human beings could be diluted and AI output will gain more value. So I think we should show more appreciation uh, to the creative works that were created by human beings with their effort. So in that sense, I think we should somehow strengthen the current copyright law and regime. And while we are discussing exemptions, there are some who oppose such introduction. And looking at this policy-related situation, how should we address AI? If we look at the regulatory trends of today, there are some attempts to introduce experimental uh, policies with regulations and boxes. But Usually, the sandboxes are for experimenting services. But there are recently some attempts to test new laws in a sandbox. So rather than confining our discussion to within the copyright regime, perhaps we could think of adopting a separate copyright legislation in regard to AI. We are talking about voluntary regulation, but I think there are obvious limitations to that. And copyright law inevitably is bound to be a bottleneck. And if we do not recognize the copyright for AI works, then it will hamper the creation of such a value ecosystem. So I think we could grant weaker rights, for example, a copyright with a term of three years for AI output while also imposing registration obligations. And when it comes to the learning or training data, while we could introduce exemptions, perhaps we could create a separate fund so that compensation could be given out to the data owners through uh, government uh, vehicles or other voluntary regulatory uh, vehicles. Um, if 
I get a chance to elaborate more on such ideas during the panel discussion, I would happy to be happy to do so. I think my time is up. So I just wanted to give this as a food for thought, perhaps making a separate legislation for AI. And thank you for uh, paying attention to my presentation. The AI thank you very much for your words. You've talked about the importance of AI governance as well as some of the um, trends in the uh, major jurisdictions. And I think she did a very good job of summarizing the different presentations that were given today. So we have about 50 minutes for the panel discussion. And so um, the moderator is going to be Professor Tehi Lee of Korea University School of Law. Let's uh, start the roundtable discussion with a big round of applause. Um, hello, everyone. We will get right um, started right away. So today's forum is talking about the core issues around copyright and AI and what we're going to do about it. We have heard many proposals. We've had a discussion. So we've talked about the legal aspects as well as the technological aspects. And we have also talked about the Korean situation and Singapore, US, UK. And so we have also made a legal comparative analysis. So it has been a very comprehensive kind of discussion discussion. We have a lot of um, questions and we may not be able to entertain all of them because time is rather limited. So can I go straight ahead and ask you the questions? In Korea, AI, so um, there's a question raised by a Korean attorney at law uh, for Mr. Huang. The voice of a real uh, singers are being synthesized, uh, learned by the AI to produce cover songs. So, unloading such cover songs could be some cases that we are seeing. Then the original. Uh, composer of the song and the original singer of the cover song, uh, do they have any uh, legal issues with such cover songs and are there any other measures to address such cases? And do you have any plans to respond to these issues? Director Huang? Well, with regard to that question, when it comes to Komka, Rather than neighboring rights, we look at copyright uh, associated with composition. So the voice of the singer and the recording re related rights, which are a part of the publicity rights or the neighboring rights are not what we deal with. So even if there are infringement issues, as an association, we do not address those issues. But just to look at it, from a copyright uh, perspective, rather than an AI, I think the co cover songs are cases where they just used the songs, and this is definitely infringement, so uh, that definitely needs to be responded with uh, necessary measures. So you mentioned publicity rights. Publicity right infringement leads to the infringement of the portrait rights or this could uh, be deemed as against fair competition, but infringement of publicity rights are only uh, dealt with in the proposed amendment built or. And so it's um, only been dealt as a matter of antitrust. And so chat GPT was um, emerged and the chat GPT-4 has already been uh, emerged as well. So I think this question can be made to any of the speakers from any of the jurisdictions. The chat GPT, well, in your countries, you have the the TDM exemptions were legislated even before the chat GPT came out. But in Korea, before chat GPT, the TDM exception was proposed, but it was still being discussed in the national essentially. But the TDM exception became a really hot issue, and there was a lot of um, change of opinion after ChatGPT3 came out. In UK, the TDM 
for now is um, for only non-commercial purposes and in US and Europe according to article 4 in the directive there is no distinction between commercial versus non-commercial so uh, even commercial TDM is also accepted. And I think the question, the situation also goes for Singapore as well. So before the chat GPT-3, you have the TDM exceptions that were legislated. And then you have the chat GPT-3. Then now you have the chat GPT-4. So have there been any change in position regarding the TDM exceptions? Are there any questions regarding the appropriateness of the TDM exceptions? Because now we see chat GPT-3 or 4. So um, any of the speakers, I think, can have a go at this question. Maybe from, well, can you hear from UK first? Um, um, Professor Alina, would you like to go first? Yes, thank you. Um, stop hearing my own voice in my own ear. Um, so uh, I think from a UK perspective, it's still on the non-commercial side. So the text and data mining exception remains what it is in the Copyright Act. Um, what is more interesting, which I think for, from a comparative perspective, um, can be said, is the situation in the EU, if I may say one thing on it. And the two exceptions that are there, the one for research um, organizations for uh, non-commercial purposes, cannot be contracted out. It's mandatory. The one for commercial purposes, however, can be contracted out. And in the UK, when the consultation took place, this was touched upon in the responses, and there was a question as to what is the experience of users and stakeholders with contracting out? How are they approaching text and data mining? And it was in the time where ChatGPT was, all of, these, all of its revisions and editions were coming to life. And those that replied to that question said, we contract out. We insert a clause to contract out of text and data mining. So, it is on the radar and people don't want to be involved. So the scare that you have just described, the, the hype, is having some sort of an effect. Um, but from a legislative perspective, from the law as it stands in the UK, we have what we have. We have the, the provision that I showed you, which remains only for um, those non-commercial and research purposes. <coughs> But then, but then when we talk about generative AI, is there a AI model that you can restrict or to limit only to non-commercial use when it comes to generative AI? Is there kind that kind of AI model? So if you're going to um, train it and you're going to service it, it's going to be for the general public, right? And even if it's for free, you know, it will be for commercial purposes. So can there be an AI model that's non-commercial? So people say that it's non-existent. What do you think? That's a very good question. And there's been a lot of talk about this, actually, especially in light of these two exceptions that exist in the EU, because one is really strong. You cannot contract out of it. So there has been a lot of um, speculation that many companies will actually present themselves as operating on a non-commercial basis so that uh, they can benefit from this strong mandatory exception. But at the end of the day, the bottom line is that there will be commercial. The, the thrive behind this non-contract uh, out uh, exception for research was basically yeah. to make research possible, to make the discovery of the new drugs, the discovery of the new treatments, thriving on lots of data indexed and data mining possible. But this was pre-generative okay. AI, and you're very right to pose this question. All right. Is there any comment from a Singapore? Yes, so I think um, what I mentioned earlier about how the landscape has changed, that certainly applies when, we, when, the, when the legislation came into force. Um, that's about 2021 we started to hear a little bit of feedback from the stakeholders that, hey, you know, when you guys consulted on this a few years back, uh, this wasn't something, generative AI wasn't really on the cards. So some of us who had certain, some of us maybe didn't even respond 
um, to your public consultation or have issues with the tax and data mining exception or with the scope of the exception because we didn't anticipate um, that's how technology would move. Um, and, and I think we acknowledge that, which is why in my presentation I did say that uh, the landscape has evolved quite a fair bit since 2016 and even now. The thing is, it's 2023 now, two years since our exception came into force. In, in the larger scheme of things, two years is still quite a short time to be able to, to judge what is the effect of your policy. And when you're looking at a space such as this, when you have such rapid technological developments, and you have also businesses that are constantly trying to um, come up with different business models or adapt to those changes, it's very hard to say uh, now is the time to make further legislative change um, in light of this development in generative AI. And I think also when we look at drafting laws, the, one of the key principles we try to have in mind is having legislation that is as far as possible future-proof. Of course, it's almost impossible to be future-proof, but you strive towards that standard. And in this instance, I would say that then, given the objectives I've shared about our tax and data mining exception, they are actually quite in line with the sudden boom in generative AI and we are glad that it's actually able to respond to some of these developments now. Okay. Uh, Why don't we move on to the next question? This is a question from law firm Sugar Square. Both home and abroad, AI. We would like to. I would like to hear about some real uh, disputes related to AI and copyright. As far as I know. There are lawsuits in U.S. Uh, amounting to eight related to copyright issues and AI. And John Doe 1, John Doe 2, of course, these are fake names, but they have raised uh, lawsuits against co-pilots. This was the first lawsuit last year, and this year, January, Getty Images and Stability Diffusion was sued. and. ChatGPT was also sued from multiple claimants. So Getty Images has another lawsuit in London High Court, and eight lawsuits in US and one in UK are ongoing. But in Korea, we have Hyperclova X as our only uh, Gen AI model from Naver, so there are no disputes. But I think there is potential for legal conflicts going forward. Because Hyperclova X trains with news content, so the media outlets and neighbor could be embroiled in such uh, disputes. Of course, it depends on the interpretation of terms of use, but I see potential for conflict. And well, if we look at the use of training data becoming an issue, the registration of copyright uh, for two cases, the Beller case and the Zarya of Dawn cases were rejected for registration and AI, a creativity machine, has made a recent entrance to Paradise Image. But the U.S. Copyright Office rejected, turned down its uh, file for registration. And in August, the first uh, federal court of Washington, D.C., has said that such a rejection was lawful are some recent trends. So I think the real issue here at point is the fair use. TDM exemption and fair use both exist in Singapore. And when it comes to Korea, we, well, if we pass TDM, then we will follow the steps of Singapore by having both provisions. But when it comes to the US and Korea, I think this fair use is an issue that could be applied to such lawsuits. And if we see a fair use related to such lawsuits in Korea, fair use provision will really be uh, at the center of such conflicts. So 
Well, I would like to ask our speakers from the U.S. whether the AI use of training data uh, protected by copyright falls under fair use. And by the end of October, the U.S. copyright will receive comments regarding this issue. And one of the comments is with regards to the AI training data, looking at the Oracle case and the Andy Warhol case to really look at whether it falls under fair use, especially it is a federal Supreme Court case when it comes to the Andy Warhol case. So whether it is fair use or not, we'll have to look at if it's commercial or non-commercial. If it is commercial and it has no other justifiable purposes, then if, well, it was ruled as not transformative use. So. I think this will have huge implications to the AI issue. So why don't I ask Andrew and Professor Rajan on this, whether it falls under fair use or not? Thank you. I think you have identified. There comes up. There. And uh, Professor Rajan actually covered this well earlier in her speech. I think in the United States, it is an open question how courts will analyze fair use in this context. Uh, a few years ago, the leading case would have been Google Books. And I think many scholars and others in the United States felt, yeah, this kind of Google Books uh, helps make an argument for certain non-expressive uses um, of copyrighted works. And so the mood, if not any level of certainty, was, yeah, this probably will, if it gets to the courts, probably will be ruled a fair use, but again, uncertain. And as Professor Rajan mentioned, that mood has shifted in the last year. Um, partly, I think, a reflection of the Warhol case more than a direct consequence. And I'll explain what I mean. So the Warhol case, at least from my point of view, and I'll speak again for, my, for myself here more than for the US Copyright Office, it didn't actually change the fair use analysis. It placed some additional emphasis on the commerciality factor. But if you are, say, a litigant trying to argue it, if you want to say that AI training is not fair use, then you say, yes, Warhol really emphasized commerciality and market harm. If you want to say it's, it actually helps the fair use argument, you could say, well, actually, the Warhol decision shows the importance of narrowing your focus to the specific use at issue. It was, in Warhol, it was not just that they were using visual arts, it was that it was specifically licensing it, the image, in the same market that the original author was licensing her images. So then you turn to AI and say, well, the specific use is training. If somebody then later on wants to use the model to compete, that's a whole different, that's a whole separate analysis. So that's my way of saying, I don't think Warhol actually resolves the question in the United States, but it has helped uh, change, or at least reflects a change in the mood. Uh, certainly the fact that there's so much litigation now suggests that some of the rights holder organizations are feeling more confident that they can make an argument that it's not fair use. But it's a, it's a very interesting, it is the key question, and we are looking forward to the responses. Okay, do we have one more comment? Yeah, I'll just add that I agree with Andrew's comments about 150 uh, percent. <laughs> maybe I'll just add a couple of small uh, additional points as well. Uh, I, I would really emphasize what you just said, Andrew, about the, um, the uh, significance of the Warhol and Goldsmith situation in terms of licensing. And so I think that's where it gets a little bit interesting because we've been talking quite a bit today about opt-outs and the uh, control that creators would like to have over the uses made of their work. So I think that takes us back to this question, uh, how do we deal with opt-outs and, and so on. So it's interesting that f the fair use discussion and the opting out uh, issue are also related. Second point I'll make just very quickly is, um, again, just building on what Andrew has just said, in terms of that distinction between commercial and non-commercial use, I think what we've seen throughout the digital era, not only since Google Books, but even going back further to Napster and all of the things that happened with the music industry, is that that distinction between commercial and non-commercial is more and more difficult to draw on a practical level and um, therefore is not really helping us to understand the direction of things in the future. So it's always a little bit uh, illusory with fair use, I think, because you have such well-defined guidelines in the US Copyright Act, and I imagine the situation is quite similar in Korea. Um, but unfortunately, that only takes us towards a certain level of procedural certainty, uh, and we can't predict the actual outcomes of these decisions. 
so actually this discussion is really important because if we have a litigation in Korea, that's precisely going to be the issue at hand. So building up on that, I would like to just ask another question. So right now in US, I said that there are about eight litigations ongoing. Two are not about copyright, and the other six are about copyright. And so, but they're not about, even if they are about copyright, it's not about fair use, because um, the defendant is arguing about whether there was copying, and they have to prove the copying, and the plaintiff is saying that it's going to be proved that there was copying. So only then, only if there is copying, can you use a fair use offense. And the Chamberlain, um, so in the case, there was a submission of the summary. So the plaintiff, I mean, what do you think? Isn't it difficult to prove that there was indeed copying? Because you're talking about huge data sets here. And then individual rights holders say that their work was used. And the individual rights holders will find it very difficult to prove all that, wouldn't it? Uh, yes, indeed, they do. Um, so in the United States, you've seen in these litigations, the strategy has shifted somewhat over time of how to allege that your work was actually in the training data set. So in some of the early cases, they just flat out failed to allege this, and those cases were bounced on that grounds. Some of the most recent cases involving suits against Meta and OpenAI brought by many famous authors mm -hmm try to allege that, hey, we asked ChatGPT to summarize our books, and it spat out an accurate summary, or it pitched us an outline for a sequel, so therefore the original work must have been the trading data set. And it's not clear yet how successful that is going to be as an allegation to show that you were in the data set. Um, I'm blanking on what my other point was. Oh, yeah. On the other hand, you have a case like the Getty Images case, where they were, I think, Professor, you had an example earlier on their slide where they have this image where they were able to get uh, stable diffusion to, to spit out an image that had something resembling a watermark from Getty. And that would tend to lead to the inference that Getty's images were in the water set because it's clearly learned to associate certain kinds of images with a watermark. So in, I think probably this is an easier thing for, in some cases, for image generation, maybe. Um, but it's, it's difficult. That, Getty Images has probably the best way of doing it so far, but although even then, I bet that they spent many, many, many hours and thousands of prompts before they got that image that looked, that had that watermark and looked relatively similar. It's just, it varies across the litigation. It's a real trick, and that's why we're actually asking about it in our notice of inquiry, because again, it's, it's not clear. I think the most recent lawsuits in the United States show that the litigants, even very sophisticated ones, are struggling with this idea of how they will allege. Okay. 그러면 요, 요 소송, 소송과 관련해서 마지막 좀 더... So perhaps the last issue here is that commercial and non-commercial uh, TDM use is increasingly difficult to distinguish and Andrew said uh, non-expressive use and that is relevant in the AV case right and the Hardy Trust case which is about non-expressive use so when it comes to the non-expressive use, this rationale, can this be applied to the AI training? I think it seems pretty obvious that it is a non-expressive use, but Gen AI doesn't end at training, but it generates outputs based on that learning. So the doctrine of non-expressive use, can this be applied to AI training cases? Yes. Okay. The use can be applied to the AI learning or training. Can I respond to that question indirectly? Oh, okay. Uh, and it is up to you. That, yes, I think, I think we can all see the resemblance between the Google and HathiTrust situation and the one that we are facing now. So, yes, obviously there are some comparisons to be made there. And it is a situation where we're talking about non-expressive use. But again, remember the situation we're dealing with is one of great unpredictability, great uncertainty. 
And the, let me actually suggest that there is another way of thinking about this, which is completely useless in the United States context, because for now, because I'm going to talk about moral rights for a minute. But here's a situation where the moral right of attribution may actually provide us with a connection between the non-expressive aspect and the expressive aspect. Because the issue that, that you have identified is something more like counterfeiting or passing off, I think, where we are using the name, the style, the identity, the association with a particular creator or a particular group of creators in a non-expressive context to yield an expressive work that bears similarities to the previous expressive works made by those creators. So this is where we get troubled in copyright law, I think, because the connections are also indirect. And copyright law is not built to deal with these indirect relationships. It's supposed to be more straightforward. You have the work, somebody copies, there's an infringement, let's all go and have lunch, we're finished. But Unfortunately, here there are so many transitory steps. How do we establish the link between the thing that is happening about which we are concerned and the end result? So I would suggest once again that the moral right or the counterfeiting example might be a, a useful way of thinking about this. Okay. Especially in Korean context where you have such developed moral rights legislation. Okay. 그럼 다음 주제로 넘어가세요. 우리 고한. On to the next question. I'd like to ask a question to Mr. Hangyu Kim. 그러니까 자 현재 생. We have this question from a patent lawyer. The current Gen AI learns the distribution of data, so it is difficult to attribute AI with creativity. But is there research going on for developing AI with creativity? And how can such creativity be manifested technologically? Well, I think it is difficult to just uh, say the learning takes place in the form of data distribution learning. But could you give your comment on that? Well, if I am to describe the working principle, learning data distribution is the training uh, that is used for Gen AI, well, for LLM and image generative AI, they learn so much data. So even if they just learn the distribution properly, they could come up with infinite combinations sufficient to respond to any prompt that they are faced with. They can generate text and image to uh, fulfill the prompt. The output of Gen AI seems creative because of that aspect. Well, right now they respond one to one in terms of prompt and answer. But if we give them longer term goals, then they could do self-review to, in the end, uh, take on more complicated tasks and research to develop AI with such capacity as currently ongoing. But in fact, the sentiments of uh, human beings must be included in order to be eligible for copyrightability, according to some definitions, then that is not fulfilled by the current uh, level of AI outputs. Well, this is another question uh, for Mr. Ko and General Counsel Maxwell Sills. According to page 85 of the booklet, the Comca presentation, it says that the owner of the original work uh, learned by a uh, generative AI will be deemed the copyright holder for the AI output. Uh, this is not the case of uh, France. And when it comes to AI outputs, I would like to know if we have the technological solutions to um, point to what data or what original works was learned by AI. So is it possible to capture the moment when the copying takes place, as uh, Professor Rajan mentioned, and how will this be implemented in the operation in reality, given the industrial circumstances? Well, when looking at the copyright issues relevant to AI, no matter what output it makes, 
figuring out what data in the training data was uh, referred to to generate that output, if we can distinguish that, identify what work was referred to, and even quantify the percentage of contribution, then relatively fair uh, compensation for the owners of that data will be possible. But when we look at the current level of the model, um, the models are so complicated and a lot of calculations that take place in the hidden uh, state needs to be inferred in reverse and the causality with the input data must be calculated, but that is too daunting of a task at this point and doing reverse calculation requires almost another uh, AI model just dedicated to that purpose. So from the current technological level, I think this is not very feasible from the technical perspective. So explainable AI, XAI is another field of research that we are seeing recently. So the most representative and well-known uh, Gen AI, such as Midjourney and ChatGPT, we will have to see how long it will take to see these more developed AIs to be replacing uh, those. What? <laughs> that was a great answer. But I think maybe um, there is sometimes a common misunderstanding that these systems are just training their data training on their data, learning the distributions, and just kind of repeating it. But what might be being missed is, th think about your own brain. If I were to ask you to paint a picture of a blue sky, a beautiful blue sky, and you thought, in, in terms of an entire life's experiences of things and pictures and experiences that you had, that also happened to have the shade of blue. And I said, okay, thank you. Now tell me, we're going to go back, tell me where you got that idea. It's impossible because you have extracted it. Um, there, there were cross-correlated distributions from all the experiences you had. And um, I think this kind of goes to the training data as well, this misconception that the power, I mean, the power of the models definitely relies in part on having exceptional data. But I think we're missing the ability of these models to create entirely new concepts that they weren't trained on just by synthesizing and learning properties that no one told them to learn from, uh, from their inputs. And I think that's this logic of what went in is exactly what should come out um, is, pro is probably creating lots of upset among rights holders. Like, so for example, just because ChatGPT is able to recite the summary of a plot of a book doesn't necessarily mean it was trained on that book. And our plot summaries by themselves do copyright protection. So I, I think there's a misconception about how the models are trained and then an ultimate focus on everything is protected by copyright. So I think we're dropping the nuance of how they're training and what they're learning from their inputs. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. So now we're talking about um, huge hyper AI and training. Those AI would be based on the data sets that Google itself has, uh, proprietary data, but for other kind of AI models, it's scraping. And so AI developers, whether it be the server or the computer, would have to go through the process of copying. And after copying the data set, the developer would have to go through the cleansing and the purification process, um, noise or denoise. And then that would also ensue additional copying as well. But when we, well, what we usually refer to inputting and also triggering an AI model. So that does not necessarily entail copyrighted works being inputted, inputted into the learning process. It's actually converted into um, numerical expressions inside the computer to go through the computing process. 
And so there are possibilities of copying, but you cannot interpret that as copying, or you cannot sort of capture that point of actual copying. It's really hard. And uh, so it's really about verifying um, the rights holders. So now let me give a question to Professor Hesun Yoon. So you talked about e AI governance, and it's a bit abstract. And so the question is also abstract a bit as well. So you have the user and of the generative AI, and then you have the output, and then there will be there may be an infringement of copyright. Are there any discussion regarding the liability of the user? If there is any discussion regarding the legal liability of the user of the infringing generative AI output, um, how is that proceeding? And then um, you have somebody from um, the the Krausha Kuma from Cadis. Uh, the question is, how is artificial intelligence transforming the landscape of copyright protection and enforcement in the digital age, and what are the key challenges and opportunities it presents to creators, the content owners, and the legal system as far as its homogeneity is concerned? It's a bit abstract and quite a difficult question, but Professor Yoon, would you like to go ahead? Oh, it, I'm not sure if I understood the question properly. So. Uh, one is, I think, about um, civil liability. I suppose the user can be sued for civil liability because, as far as I know, in Europe, there is a directive regarding the civil liability of AI, and it's linked to the main AI bill. So if copyright is infringed and other kind of rights have been infringed, then the directive could be used to as sort of like a guideline about the civil liability. But I don't think that level of discussion is taking place in Europe, uh, in Korea. But I think if the bill passes in Europe, I think then there'll be a proper discussion in Korea. I didn't quite understand the second question. So the second question is, um, how is AI transforming the landscape of copyright protection and enforcement in the digital age? And uh, what are the key challenges and opportunities it presents to creators, content owners, and the legal system as far as its homogeneity is concerned? So I'm not sure if I'm the right person to answer that question. Perhaps um, maybe Andrew or maybe some of the other copyright experts can answer that question. This one. Actually, say in English. English. I have uh, an idea. In, in English and Korean. If you want, I can jump in. Okay. Um, so, something that you, came you straight can, to uh, mind um, when this question was raised is um, enforcement and AI and filters. So, we've had a lot of discussion in the European Union on maybe you have heard of Article 17 the liability for platforms and user-generated content, and how are we are going to make sure that copyright infringing content stays off uh, those platforms um, efficiently, effectively, goes off and stays off. So there used to be a reference to AI technologies when this directive was discussed from 2016 until 2019. Now, when you read the directive on copyright in the digital single market, you do not find a reference to AI. But if you read carefully the provisions and Article 17 and the reference to best efforts that that provision makes, it very clearly appears that the best efforts that a platform can undertake in order to make sure that copyright content is off are those best efforts in the industry, and the industry uses filters, uses these filtering systems, which thrive on AI. This was the long link. Uh, but I mean, now it is long when you spell it out like that, but it has been a discussion we've had at the, you know, the EU, you know, EU level a lot. So there is a bit of a talk as to how are these platforms going to cope with all this material that goes, and AI seems very much the answer there. Now, there is also a lot of attention to fundamental rights and making sure that copyright content, which is supposed to be there, which is allowed to be there, permitted uses, parodies, pastiche, and so on, are not taken down er erroneously. 
Um, and that's where the human intervention comes in. So it is a discussion of enforcement through artificial intelligence in the copyright context, plus the human intervention. This is how I understood the question. Okay. I understood anything. Do you have more? I'm not sure that I <laughs> Let me try it again. <laughs> so I think for the enforcement section, I, I, would, I could not say it better. Also, as US copyright, the US Copyright Office doesn't do enforcement, so I can't add much there. On the landscape for, for the creators in the legal system, yeah, so it's really an enforcement question. I don't think I can add much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So actually, so the moderator has said that there are many litigations taking place. And so regarding the environment of the enforcement, it's really difficult to foresee. But within copyright legal system, we'll be discussing the infringement, which means that we have to base it on the current copyright law. And the enforcement would also be based on that. But um, the environment is going to change. But it depends on the content of the AI governance and copyright law. So we don't have enough data to be able to answer that question. And we don't have the results of the litigations as yet. So I think um, it's really difficult to come up with a very satisfying answer. But all I can say is that we do have to wait and see. Thank you very much. So the history of copyright was actually a response to the development of technology. As you know, um, the Gutenberg's printing press. And then in the 19th century, you had the camera, the movies radio, television, and then you have the emergence of internet. So it was all a response to new technology, and now we're talking about AI. And so, um, yes, it's something that we saw in sci-fi. Now it's become a reality. But I would say the biggest challenge for us is that until now, it was always about the human creator, the human author. In the 18th century, it came off from um, the romanticism. But now, many copyright academics and experts are now um, really grappling with the challenge of the fact that we're no longer talking about necessarily a um, human author. So the last question is for Professor Rajan. So um, in practice, many companies are using AI to develop products and they're doing research and producing a lot of different things. So related to AI, there are not really clear provisions in the copyright law. And so maybe in the future, in the near future, the copyright law might be threatened of its very existence. And so the question is, What's the direction that the copyright law should change towards? And when AI becomes completely prevalent in our everyday life, do you think the copyright law is going to continue to exist? Or is it going to evolve? Or maybe is it going to disappear? So that's the question for you. This is quite a question. <laughs> uh, it's a question that people have been asking for quite a long time at this point, actually. Not, uh, it's not the first time that we're hearing this question. I think uh, back when the digital era started, uh, which coincidentally for me was about the time I got involved in, in copyright research as well, um, a lot of questions were quickly being asked about music, peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing, music downloading, et cetera, et cetera. Were these technologies going to bring an end to copyright law? And here we are, 20 years later, we're still having these debates. Copyright law is still around. So the superficial answer to that question is no. Copyright law has managed to weather a lot of changes. It will continue to weather these changes. It will still stagger on uh, in some form or other into the future. But I think there is actually a more subtle way of looking at this history as well, which is that although copyright law is still formally around, it's certainly not the same as it was before the digital revolution started. And many people argue that copyright has become unmoored from its basic policy purposes and the reasons why it came into being in the first place. So in some form it continues to survive, but is the essence, is it a kind of zombie copyright law today? Or, or is the essence of copyright, the true spirit of copyright, does it continue to live? 
I can't answer that question, but I will say something about it going back in the history. So just to take a, a little small uh, bit of issue with the history of copyright as it was just told. So actually there is a narrative of copyright that's very popular that it came into being around the birth of romanticism and that it is the romantic vision of the author that gave rise to copyright. Actually, if we look back in the history of European copyright law, we can see that the emergence of the first Copyright Act which was the Statute of Anne of 1709-10 in the UK, preceded Romanticism by a considerable amount of time, like well over a century. And if we then examine the factors surrounding that original adoption of the Statute of Anne, the story gets even more interesting because it was a period of time uh, when in Britain there was a strong censorship regime that was exercised through the direct relationship between the sovereign and the printers who had a a conglomeration that allowed them to restrict printing to themselves, so the monopoly of the stationer's company. And throughout the uh, mid to late 17th century, uh, many people argued that this was bad for British society and writers and so on who were becoming prominent, like uh, prominent names like Milton, uh, John Locke and many, many others actually argued in favor of a free press. So actually, I think this is a slightly more detailed and accurate uh, statement of the history of copyright, which is that it was part of a process of greater democratization and empowerment of the public made possible by the spread of knowledge through the technology, as was very correctly pointed out, of the, the printing press. And the purpose of copyright at that time was then to protect the utterances of authors and to do so for the purpose of developing free independent knowledge in the society. So is that purpose still maintained by the copyright law today? Should it be? And is it compatible with the needs of technology, especially artificial intelligence? So I think these are the questions that we need to answer. Yeah, so the question was, is the copyright law going to exist or is it going to disappear? So everyone sitting here will disagree to it's going to um, disappear because, you know, all of our careers and our research will be in vain. So we are all against it being um, disappearing. So anyway, so I think um, I would have to entertain the last question on paper at least. So it's a bit long, but um, so regarding the uh, if the if there's in a human intervention into the output, or if the AI has been used, or AI was used to um, draw the preliminary drawings, for example, what do you think? I think Professor. Okay, maybe I think you'll be able to answer the question. Well, I wanted to uh, stay still, but can I perhaps add a little comment about the previous question? As AI is increasingly popularized and copyright regime stays as is, then I think it will see a lot of loopholes and data law or information law or contract law will fill in those gaps uh, in the copyright regime. And AI and creation will fall under other laws. For example, in civil law, the digital ownership is a concept that is introduced, then that will be another realm of law. So I think that are some potential developments. So we must make sure that our copyright regime makes improvements to address AI-related uh, issues. And about the questions that was just asked from uh, Jin Young Nam and Ung Jae Lee and Jung Min Lee, who is a high school student, it will take until 6 o'clock if I read and go through all of the questions. So I will just simply answer the gist of the questions. Uh, there is a slight misconception I am observing here. The reason why there are copyright issues for AI outputs is because 
there are outputs that are purely generated by AI with no a, uh, human intervention, and the quality of the works are so superior than even like human works. So that is why there are concerns that this may replace the human creators. In my view, if a human beings contributed to AI generated works, then if it is clear that AI was just an assisting tool, then the work is still deemed, should be still deemed as human creation. And I think there is a slight confusion between contract law and copyright law. So there are some contract related issues and they wonder if this is an infringement of the copyright law. But there is a slight confusion and in the US and Korea, the principle is in order to use a uh, copyrighted work, uh, they must obtain a license to do so. So well, another issue pertaining to AI is if AI unilaterally and comprehensively use a copyrighted work to generate work without uh, permission, it is difficult to identify what works were used as reference and training for the AI model. And that is an issue. So if there is a human contribution, then yes, uh, that could be deemed as a case of copyright infringement. And I think there are quite a lot of issues that could be solved under the contract law, especially looking at the question from Ung Jae Lee of Gangnam Anipos. I think this is more of a contract law issue. I will uh, skip just reiterating the question for the sake of time. Uh, so before we give the mic to the floor, I'd just like to ask the speakers. So are we going to talk about fair use or is it going to be TDM exception? And if there is liability, then the AI developer would have to get approval from the individual rights holders, which is actually impossible because, you know, we're not talking about one or two works here. The data encompasses um, huge amounts of works. Anyway, so if it's difficult to get permission, and, but if, if we, on the premise that it's an infringement, then maybe a statutory licensing or maybe payment of some kind of a compensation could be a solution. And even if we do give permission, then we you know we're talking about extended collective licensing. That could also be a viable solution. And if we were going to pay out compensation in the form of a statutory licensing, then how are we going to distribute it to the rights holders? It's really a complicated issue. So maybe somebody can comment very briefly about what you think about the procedure. Many versions of this kind of question in our notice of inquiry, and the reason is because it's a very interesting and challenging area. Um, you know, as a policy matter, there are very interesting questions that were raised, I think, both in Alina's uh, presentation and in Gavin's about the effects of a licensing regime on competition and on bias. If you require licenses, do you have AI developers relying on smaller and more particular data sets and does that bias the output? So there are these broader policy questions and then there's the practical questions you raised. How do you actually set it up? Who is, if it's, it's a statutory license, how, what's the remuneration rate? Who is, is there one theme or are there many? It's extremely complicated and I'll say from the US perspective, uh, again, we are asking about it, we are very curious to hear what different stakeholders envision as a plausible method. I've, in conversations with stakeholders, I've heard a dozen different ideas and um, I don't think any one of those ideas has gained the support of more than one stakeholder group. They all seem to want something different. It's just very, very difficult. Um, you know, the U.S. Copyright Office relatively recently uh, 
was made responsible for uh, administering the Music Modernization Act in the United States, where we have some responsibility for a licensing regime. And that was fiendishly complicated. <laughs> I imagine this would be even more so. So my perspective is, one, I agree, very, very complicated. Two, not clear how it would work. Three, I sure hope somebody has great ideas and writes us about it. <laughs> is there anyone else? Yeah. Although I am not a copyright expert, I would like to share this system that I had in mind when I was putting together my presentation. It seems like the bill in the EU will pass into law and then the users of uh, generative AI will have to provide uh, summary uh, information upon registration on what data was trained and this will have an impact on Korea and if we must follow those footsteps I would like to first ask Mr. Ko if this is techni technically feasible but companies or firms when they collect uh, training data I think they will know the sources that they are collecting it from let's say if it's from Facebook or from neighbor blog posts I think they must register all of the list of the sources. Then, depending on the scale of the company, they should make contribution for making a fund. And perhaps there could uh, be some government uh, support in that matter. Then perhaps we can make a voluntary regulatory agency, or maybe the KCC can be in charge of using that fund to pay nominal compensation to the right holders and if I am a right holder and my work was used as training data by neighbor then that let's say if KCC runs the fund then to KCC I will apply to get compensation from that fund and letting them know that I have four or five of my works included in that list, but I think this could be a very minimal amount, maybe $3 or at best $10, but just to get that uh, compensation. And the share of contribution among the companies will have to be further coordinated. Yes, that's a very good idea. So I think it's a bit similar to private copying remuneration. Uh, European Parliament, has made a new proposal regarding the AI bill, and that was about uh, disclosing the learning data. And so even if it's disclosed from the right holders' perspective, it's still quite challenging because the European Parliament has said that there has to be sufficiently detailed summary of the training data it should be disclosed and it should be documented. So, you know, you, there's a litigation against Meta. You have ChatGTP, and then you have various copyrighted works. It's not just one or two works we're talking about here. This used as a training data set. In the case of Lama, I'm sure all of your articles and theses are probably being um, trained um, upon by the AI model. We don't even know if our articles and theses are being used. So what is the level of specificity that you should be that they should be putting into your summary? I mean, that's another question and another big challenge. But last but not least, uh, we have dealt with a whole variety of different issues. If anybody on the floor has a question, I think then we have really world renowned experts here. So let me give the mic. So please give us a brief self introduction and then you can go ahead with your question. Hello, my name is Kim sang I'm an attorney at law. We're t learning about learning data and the process of um, whether there's an infringement in the learning process of inputting um, process. From the end user's perspective, you know, it's a bit of a concern whether there's an infringement or not. So one possibility that you can think about is that um, the output, AI output, may be completely different from the original work. 
And then in Korea, as far as I know, maybe in other jurisdictions like U.S., I don't think the the that would be considered as a fringe work of infringement of copyright. But then if the output is reused to rechain another AI model, then can we call it a quote unquote clean AI model? And are there any attempts to uh, retrain another AI model based on the output? So I'd like to um, ask Mr. Max Sills and also uh, Mr. Ko from LG. And is that theoretically possible? And um, the other speakers also, if you have any ideas regarding this question, um, I would like to hear your opinion. Um, Max? Let me... Uh completely avoid your question and go a different way. I think your question presupposes, and all this discussion about rights holders, presupposes an incredibly mercantilist view of human culture and society based on, I need my money, I only made creative expression for money, give me money. Um, if you look at Midjourney as an example, our company mission is to expand the powers of human communication. So AI is not being used so that people can make outputs and resell them. It's being used so the users of the system have new language. They are able to express visual ideas in ways that they've never been able to express before. They share these ideas with each other. ChatGPT, it's very scary when it's used to cheat on an exam or it's used to um, file a legal brief with that citation. But we haven't seen it used as part of a conversation with multiple people. And so I, I just want to add, because it seems like we're extremely focused on rights holders. We're pretending like fair use doesn't exist. Rights holders re need to be remunerated because it's just a line of money. Our future as a society, communicating with each other, AI is going to be in the middle of it, expanding how we communicate, expanding how we talk to one another. In that society, AI will be part of our cultural heritage, just like our language. And I think to try to apply these systems of compulsory, compulsory licensing um, and such will be seen to be completely absurd. So I just wanted to offer a perspective that rejects the mercantilist idea that is very rooted in today's understanding of what AI is. And think about what it's going to look like in five or ten years when it's an integrated part of human culture. To add on that, well, this is limited to the case of uh, language models, but there is a paper that was on the research that you touched upon. So with the AI-generated answers, this was used to fine-tune language models, and the performance was degraded from a long-term perspective. That was one of the research results that was published. So using the AI output of Gen AI as training data, there needs to be a caveat, the data, people who are in charge of data pre-processing must review the AI output that will be used as training data. When they collect training data, there are gaps. And to com compensate for those uh, gaps, well, schools or companies If they make large amount of AI output, they try to filter out uh, what is of uh, good enough quality to be used as training data, and that is used for fine tuning. And I think compared, well, that output is still based on the AI output. So I don't think this can be deemed as the clean AI or pure AI that you mentioned. Uh, did you have any comments to add? Yes, go ahead. Very quickly. 
Um, the first, on the first part of the question about a user who creates a work that does not resemble anything in the trading data set, would that ever be considered an infringement? And I think there's a minority view expressed in the United States that basically all of the output would be an infringing derivative work. Mm -hmm. um, it's a minority view. On the, tr on the question of using the output to, tr to do an additional training set, uh, I would add the concern has been, as was just mentioned, that this would degrade the quality of the overall data, but I can say that companies in the U.S. are attempting this. Um, partly they're using what is called uh, synthetic data, and part of their concern is that you eventually run out of human creative data. <laughs> they, they don't have any choice. If they want to continue to increase the amount of data in the set, they have to use uh, things they're generating. And so they're working on ways to improve this and reduce the amount of uh, harm to the data set brought on by, like sometimes what it's called, lossy or like uh, use of data. So it's an interesting question. So we're talking about copyright infringement of the output and also there was a discussion about copying and there's also the issue of the des derivative works. But according to some research, it seems that 0 .0, uh, 0 0.05 is the similarity level, according to some research, between the input and the output. And so, yes, it, the output can be similar. The AI model is seen to memorize the data. And so there is always a possibility of the similar output being rendered from the model, but um, that is not copyrightable for now. So this is a, a never-ending story also, another very important question. So, um, Because I think it's important. Um, in the UK, the position, something that you, when you were talking came to my mind, the position is very clear in terms of a work being copyright protected and infringing at the same time. This is possible. Your work, and I'm sure that this is the case in many other jurisdictions, your work can get copyright and be infringing at the same time. And this goes back to the core of copyright that Marx was mentioning as well. Copyright is a negative right. You don't get a right to do stuff with it. You get a right to exclude other people from doing certain things with your work. And we forget this very often. And there are certain situations in which you might be totally fine with other people infringing your copyright. You might be totally fine with other people using your work the way they want to. And systems have been thriving on this. The Creative Commons system has been thriving on this. So we shouldn't forget that you don't really get anything with copyright, like my colleagues um, at UCL say. You get a right to exclude other people. And that's fine. I think this is going to go to the core of generative AI over the years. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think we have a question here. Can someone bring over a microphone? Could you briefly introduce yourself? I am from law firm Zhao. I am Jun Li. I'm a lawyer. So here's my question. When it comes to training data, a requirement for disclosure of training data was mentioned. Well, the companies that train the AI models, if they provided training data not intentionally, but what about the data that was provided by the users, the input of the users that were trained, that were used for training the data in the process? And if AI uses such data as part of its knowledge and use it to produce answers for other users, can this be technologically controlled? For example, input that was given by user A cannot be used to generate answers for user B. Is this technologically feasible? And data provided by users, 
is something that maybe the companies that train the models could not predict, then such unpredictable data, if they also fall under the disclosure requirement, then how can they store and classify such user-provided data to meet that disclosure requirement? Because these are data that was provided to the AI model uh, that the companies did not provide intentionally. So how can we technologically solve this problem? Do we have anyone who can answer this question? Any volunteers? Again, okay, good. I can't, I can't answer it, but I will <laughs> say it is a very good question, and I think it gets at the real difficulty of these disclosure requirements. Um, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but like, there are so many ways in which it's just extremely difficult to know what copyrighted works are in a trading data set. You've identified one I had not even considered when it comes to like the questions and inputs of the users themselves. But even if you, even apart from them, even existing works from the trading data set, there's like in the United States, we have a registration system, but it's not mandatory. We don't know all the copyrighted works that exist in the United States. No, and nobody does. I don't know how. I don't know how you would actually operationalize the requirement. Uh, it just seems very challenging. Although I can see why the idea is very attractive, and I hope people can come up with good ways of doing it. But it seems very difficult. Yeah, 지금 시간이 너무 다 돼가지고 이제 여기서 중단을 해야 될것 같습니다. So unfortunately, we are really running out of time. So I think we have to close here. So um, I had said that copyright was a history of responding to technology. When the television first came out, you had sports competition that was screened on television. And then people thought, who's going to go to the playing field if everything's on television? So many people are against the broadcasting or sports events. What's happening now? You have the MBL. The broadcasting income is probably more than half of the entire revenue, right? So whether it be in internet or the press, printing press, the copyright has um, overcome a lot of hurdles. So I think um, the artificial intelligence will just be another hurdle that the copyright regime is going to overcome. So when we get together five years from now, we'll just probably coming together, oh, we discussed about those um, frivolous issues back five years ago. So hopefully that day will come. So with that, I'd like to, like to end the today's panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Professor Lee, and also for the speaker. Thank you for being with us. Uh, so we've had the presentations, but we also had a live discussion, and I think we we're able to get a lot of insight from this kind of discussion. And a big round of applause uh, for the panel panelists. Yes, so every day we are facing different uncertainties and the technology is evolving and developing day by day. And so in order to be able to benefit from the developed technology, we have to overcome the legal challenges. And I think we have had a very in-depth discussion in order to find um, some ways forward uh, for against those legal challenges. So we look forward to more um, opportunities like today. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank everyone for being here at the Seoul Copyright Forum 2023, and we look forward to your continued interest in our forum. Um, that was Yeonha Lee, I am your MC for today. Thank you very much.